I'll call this uh, meeting to order on Monday, May the 15th, 2017. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, very glad to have with us tonight the Reverend Pam McCurdy, the Bethany United Methodist Church, 760 Hurt Road. She's going to come forward at this time and give our invocation and also lead us in the place of flag. So would everyone please rise. and support as we begin this meeting. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the community of Smyrna and all who serve her. We thank you for the citizens of Smyrna. We thank you for the God-given capacity that exists in each of us to make this community one of peace and fairness of all, for all. We thank you for the ability to use our minds to discern your will and work to create a strong and healthy community. God, please help all gathered here to engage in meaningful dialogue. Give us listening ears and thoughtful words. Give us opened minds and open hearts. We pray for the work of the city council to be done with attentiveness, compassion, creativity, and integrity. I pray your blessings on all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now for those that uh, would like to Go to Bethany United Methodist for change, or if you're just new here in town, I'm sure they'd love to have you. It's at 760 Hurt Road. There was another guy named McCurdy, a guy named Jerry McCurdy. Is that any kin? Yes, sir. You're kidding? Well, that's great. He's a, he's a good man. He's just like his daughter in law. Thank you so much. Um, agenda changes, I don't know that we have any. We've got. Uh, a couple of proclamations um, and a third resolution to recognize uh, a special group of kids. But we're going to start, we're going to stick to the agenda. Uh, recognition of Memorial Day Poppy Weekend. Are there folks here from the Ladies Auxiliary? Well, they're always here. You're about to have y'all's money out. Uh, it's not that you don't buy them, you just donate. But it's, uh, uh, it's a great opportunity, and they come every single year. I'm going to ask that uh, uh, Corky Welch please read that uh, proclamation and uh, present it to these ladies. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A proclamation by the mayor of the city of Smyrna, Memorial Day, Poppy Weekend. Where, whereas America is the land of freedom preserved and protected willingly and freely by citizen soldiers, and whereas millions who have answered the call to arms have died in the field of battle, and whereas a nation at peace must be reminded of the price of war and the debt owed to those who have died in war. And whereas the red poppy has been designated as a symbol of sacrifice of lives in all wars. And whereas the American Legion Auxiliary has pledged to remind America annual of this, annually of this debt through to the distribution of the memorial flower. Now, therefore, I, A. Max Bacon of the city of Smyrna, City of Smyrna, Georgia, do hereby proclaim May 27th through May 29th, 2017 as Memorial Day Poppy Weekend and ask that all citizens pay tribute to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice in the name of freedom by wearing the Memorial Poppy. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Smyrna to be affixed upon this the 15th day of May in the year of the Lord, 2017. A. Max Bacon. Thank you, Ms. Pam. Anything y'all would like to say? Of course I would. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for having us here again this year. Um, actually, we do it twice a year, uh, Memorial Weekend and Veterans Day weekend. But we are so proud this evening to announce that Congress has made, proclaimed, 
pop, National Poppy Day this year is uh, Friday, the 26th of May. So it's the first time in all the years that this flower has been adopted as the memorial flower that they've recognized it. So it's, it's really an honor uh, for all, all of the uh, Americans and, and our heroes that have died before and uh, to the American Legion and the Auxiliary for all the hard work they did to raise funds to help our veterans and our community. Thank you. Get, out, get, get that $20 bill out, Corky. And <laughs> Thank you. All I had was a 50. <laughs> and we have a second proclamation in recognition of Dr. William B. Marcioni. And I know that uh, uh, Susan Wilkinson has that. I know there's our librarian is here and a lot of folks from the Friends of the Library. Um, I didn't see Bill though. Okay, yeah. Y'all all come forward as Susan reads this proclamation. Um, I think you're good right there. Buddy, <laughs> Susan? Okay, I was just waiting for everybody to come up. Um, all right, this is a, pro a proclamation by the mayor of the city of Smyrna in rec recognition of Dr. William P. Marchion. Whereas Dr. William P. Marchion is an energetic and passionate volunteer, organizer, and advocate for our community, especially for the Smyrna Public Library and the Smyrna Arts and Cultural Council. And whereas Dr. Marchion relocated from Boston, Massachusetts to Smyrna, Georgia in 2009 and joined the board of the Friends of Smyrna Library in 2012, where among other contributions, he created the first Sunday lecture series and continues to present original local history research several times per year, initiated the Smyrna collection of local history papers and documents and cataloged scores of these documents and organized the Smyrna Oral History Project and transcribed the interviews and Whereas in 2013, Dr. Marchion researched and wrote a history of the city of Smyrna and the book entitled A Brief History of Smyrna, Georgia was published by History Press the same year. And whereas in 2014, M Mayor Max Bacon requested Dr. Marchion lead the Quality of Place Subcommittee for the Smyrna Strategic Vision Project. And as a result of this process, Dr. Marchion served as president of the steering committee during the creation of the Smyrna Arts and Cultural Council. And whereas Dr. Marchion served as SACC's first vice president after an election of officers, he served as co-chair for an ad hoc SACC committee in the development of the Junkwell City Historical Trail mobile app and he continues to lead several historical initiatives between both the Friends of Smyrna Library and the Smyrna Arts and Cultural Council. Now, therefore, I, A. Max Bacon, Mayor of the City of Smyrna, do hereby recognize Dr. William P. Marchion, outstanding, that Marchion's outstanding service, many contributions, and love for his adopted community, and I extend to him the gratitude of the citizens of Smyrna. <laughs> I have never known a, um, um, a northerner, I would say Yankee, that has <laughs> that given back so much to, to our community. And we, uh, Bill, we appreciate that and all the hard work that you've done, all the research. And um, if you haven't, read the book, it's, it's, it's not very long, because I've read it, it's one of my, it's not like, the, what's that book that you have to read, War and Peace, it's about this thick, yeah? Uh, but it's, it's a brief history of Smyrna, and it is absolutely wonderful. I would just suggest that everybody today buy one. Um, but uh, Bill, thank you so much. If you want to say something, or, or 
Well, I'd like to express my appreciation to the uh, to you, Mayor Bacon, and to the City Council for this uh, uh, certificate of, uh, of recognition. And it's been a great pleasure to me to be working uh, in this community on uh, to reveal its its history to the uh, to an increased uh, audience over the past several years. Um, it seems that every community that I've lived in or even taught in over the years, I've become interested in its history. And uh, uh, Smyrna has, is a very interesting community, and I've enjoyed the experience, enjoyed the collaboration with so many of its residents in doing local history for the, uh, for the city of Smyrna. And I thank you again. I'll say this. We're very fortunate the day you moved to Smyrna, Georgia. And... Um, I can't tell you personally how much I appreciate uh, the time you've spent, the information that you've uh, shared with us, and uh, um, you're one of these Yankees that we don't want to go back. <laughs> uh, Little uh, chance of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, though, Bill, Thank so you. much. Thank you. Although it's not listed on the agenda, uh, before I get to item C, which um, is the introduction of the Campbell High School student government president, um, we have one more, and we didn't have it on the agenda for tonight because they just won the championship Friday night, and that's to recognize Whitfield Boys varsity soccer team. Uh, they won the first ever uh, Class A state championship Friday the 12th. Uh, I'm going to let Ron Fennell, who his children go there and his wife, uh, is an administrator down there that um, I'm going to let him do the honors, but I know the coach is here, so. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's with pride that I acknowledge to the world that Whitfield Academy is in Ward 7 in the city of Smyrna. You may have a Mableton address. It's only the postal designation. You're a city of Smyrna. Uh, I'm going to read this resolution. I'm happy to see most of the team here and the parents and the coaches. So I'm going to read this, and we're going to have a group photo when we're done. And uh, whoever scored the winning goal can uh, boast and get up front here. A resolution of the Smyrna City Council, whereas Whitfield Academy is a distinctive Christ-centered college preparatory school in Smyrna, Georgia, which has played a key role in preparing many Smyrna students for college and life since 1997. And whereas the Whitfield Academy Wolfpack has distinguished themselves over the years, setting records and winning state titles in not only athletics, but in arts and academics as well. Whereas the Wolfpack varsity soccer team has raised, risen from having no team just four years ago to becoming the newest Whitfield varsity team to win a state championship. That's a remarkable thing. Uh, whereas the stunning rise has proven uh, to be an example of great character, teamwork, sportsmanship, perseverance, triumph over adversity, and skilled coaching. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Smyrna City Council hereby commends and congratulates the Whitfield Wolfpack varsity soccer team, and I'm going to read the fellow's names who made this happen, Hunter Bellotti, Rashid Bellotti, Jacob Burkett, Jason Dinschel, Aaron Hargis. Why don't you stand up whenever I call your names as we do it again? Hunter Bellotti. Rashid Bilotti. Y'all can keep, keep standing. Yeah, yeah, stay standing there if you don't mind. Jacob Burkett, Jason Denschel, Aaron Hargis, Stephen Hellyer, William Hellyer, Patrick Hepner, K.J. Johnson, Jared Jones, John Methune, Clayton McLemore, Matthew Elogid Elogid Did I get it right? Elogid Day. Sorry. I'll get it right one of these days. You just keep hitting me on it. Josh Orr. West Pat Peterson, Miles Rowe, Henry Sanchez, Simon Sinchinson, Walker Smith, Chip Soud, Matt Soud, Matthew Sumlin, Trey Terrell. And they have to have a coach. And they have coaches. Stephen Hellyer, the head coach, Brian Edwards, Jake Feigl, and Jamie Highschool. Please join me in welcoming the 1A state champion, men's soccer team from Whitfield Academy, 2017 champions as of Friday. Congratulations, man. I would just make one correction. It's the boys, not the men. <laughs> Where are the coaches? 
left me hanging here. <laughs> left you hanging. <laughs> um, I, well, I will say about this team that um, they have modeled uh, character, um, Christ-centeredness, and a love of the game and a love of each other throughout the whole season. We were certainly not the most talented team in Class A, but their effort and their work and their love for each other um, was what, and the grace of God <laughs> is what um, propelled these guys. And it, it is a, it is a, um, a testimony to um, their effort, but also um, good gifts given from a great God. So. How did the uh, player you want to hoist the trophy and share it with the group? I'll have my two captains come do that. William Hellyer and Aaron Hargis. Cool. <laughs> Uh, where, oh, here she comes. One back there. There she is. Photo bomb. <laughs> That's so sad. Congratulations. <laughs> and as an added reward, you don't have to stay for any more of the meeting. That's better than hoisting the trophy. Congratulations. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. See ya. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that privilege. You're welcome. Uh, something that we've done for the last 15 years is that we have uh, allowed the Campbell High School student government president to actually preside over a council meeting. And this year, uh, we have Harold Trong, who is here. Harold, you can come on up. Uh, he is the student government uh, president of Campbell High School, and he will now take over the meeting, and he, I'll be right behind him. Uh, I know the stuff. I know you told me to get my stuff out of the way. Um, <laughs> he will take over the meeting. I, I'm not sure if his parents are here or not. Uh, never mind. They're probably watching on TV. I'll sit back there. You sit here. Got your, there's the screen. Does he know about the screen? Yes, sir. You're going to be amazed at how smart they are. Okay. I got to use this in case you need damage, y'all. Thank you, Mayor Bacon, for the wonderful introduction. I am honored to serve as your honorary mayor tonight. The next item on the agenda is item number four, land issues, zonings, and annexations. I don't, wait, do I go? Thank you, honorary mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this first item um, is regarding a zone, rezoning request for Mr. Joshua W. Hall. Um, this rezoning is for, from R15 to R15 conditional for the development of five new single-family homes at a density of 2.27 units per acre. 
This zoning request was heard by the Planning and Zoning Board at the March 13th, 2017 meeting and was recommended for approval by a vote of four to two with conditions. The Planning and Zoning Board originally heard the rezoning request to rezone the property from R15 to RAD conditional. The applicant subsequently amended the rezoning application to request a zoning change from R15 to R15 conditional. Community Development recommends approval of the rezoning request for five single family units at a density of 2.27 units per acre with conditions. Uh, Rusty Martin, our senior planner, is here to give you additional background. Good evening. Um, as Mr. Mrs. Uh, Tammy, Tammy stated, we did have a planning zoning board meeting on um, March 13, 2017. At that meeting, there was a lot of uh, public opposition to the rezoning at that time from RAD to I mean, from R15 to RAD. Um, the Planning and Zoning Board took that uh, request and recommended approval by a vote of four to two. But in between the Planning and Zoning Board meeting and this meeting tonight, we have had two public meetings since that point. Uh, the first meeting was at the beginning of April, where staff met with Forest Hill subdivision or neighborhood and basically went through the planning and zoning and development processes for the city. Then last week, February, or I'm sorry, May 10th, we had a, another meeting with the Forest Hills neighborhood where the applicant pre presented his plan and changes to that plan from the planning and zoning board meeting. And that's where we're at tonight. And some of those in changes include modifying the zoning request to R15 conditional to eliminate the, the use of RAD. The subject property is zoned, is, is zoned R15 and is located at 1258 Hayes Drive. It's approximately 2.2 .2 acres in size and it has frontage on Hayes Drive and uh, King Springs Road. There's currently one single family uh, home on the site with, with one accessory structure. Um, the applicant is proposing five single family homes at a density of 2.2 units per acre. Uh, four of those single family homes will front on Hayes Drive and one will be accessed from uh, King Springs. As you can see, all the properties to the north, uh, east and west are zoned R15 and the property adjoining to the south is zoned RAD. There is no land use change associated with this request uh, due to the density being 2.2 units per acre. It's under three units per acre, which is the requirement under the city's future land use map. As you can see, everything to the east of King Springs Road has a suburban residential uh, land use classification. Here's the proposed site plan. Uh, this site plan is a little bit different than uh, what was submitted for uh, the Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, the original submittal had lots that were uh, 12 to 13,000 square feet in size with approximately uh, 20,000 uh, square feet of open space where the detention facility is located. Um, in addition, the, the applicant had requested a, a front setback reduction from 35 feet to 30. This site plan reflects uh, residential lots that are over 15,000 square feet in size and has removed the request for the front setback reduction to 30 feet. So this is reflecting a front setback of 35 feet. Um, in the back, you can see there's a 16,000 square foot open space. Part of that open space will be used as a, a de detention facility. The detention facility is located right there. And with this request, there are two uh, variances, one for lot width from 85 feet down to 55 feet, 
and then an interior side setback reduction from 10 feet down to five. And what we mean by interior side setback are those side setbacks in between lots two and three, three and four, and four and five. The exterior setbacks will remain 10 feet in width, uh, which is uh, the same as within the R15 zoning district. Here are the zoning proposal, or the, the home elevations associated with the zoning proposal. This will give you a streetscape of what, it, what these homes will look like on Hayes Drive. Again, these are architectural features that you'll, you may find on some of these homes. Here's pictures of the subject property. Um, the picture up in the upper left-hand corner is the view from Hayes. And another, as you move, go clockwise, another uh, picture of, from Hayes. And then finally, the view from King Springs. And these are all adjoining properties. Just to give you an idea and context of what, what the area looks like. Community development recommends approval of the rezoning of the subject property from R15 to R15 conditional for five single family homes at a density of 2.2 units per acre uh, with the following conditions. Uh, standard conditions from section 1201 associated with building composition, protective covenants, open space requirements, stormwater management, underground utilities, traffic improvements, burying of debris, tree ordinance, and landscaping requirements. In addition to those conditions, we have also added some special conditions that are specific to the site. Uh, number 13 deals with the minimum front set, well, the minimum setbacks with the front being 35 feet, the exterior side being 10, interior side five, and the rear 30. Uh, stipulation number 14 deals with the minimum lot size being a minimum 15,000 square feet. Uh, stipulation 15 requires a minimum driveway length of 22 feet. 16 requires um, sidewalk and, and, and a grass buffer along Hayes and King Springs. 17 deals with uh, trees during the development phase of the property. Uh, 18 uh, requires that the storm man water management facility be located on its own lot owned by the HOA. And 19 uh, requires uh, the development to be built in substantial compliance to the site plan you've seen up here. 20 uh, binds the applicant to the elevations submitted. Uh, 21 is a list of agreeable stipulations by the applicant. Uh, 22, uh, there needs to be some differentiation between the homes. Uh, number three, deals with uh, driveway setbacks for lots two and five. Uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. All right. At this time, I'd like to ask anyone else who wants to speak to come forward. If you do, please state your name, spell your last name, state your address for the official records and what comments you have to make. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Members of the council. For the record, my name is Garv Sams, and I, I represent uh, Josh Hall. In connection with this application for rezoning, I have uh, Mr. Hall with me tonight, and of course, he's available to respond to any questions. And as usual, uh, Rusty's done a good job of teeing it up for you, so he's given you the, the, the basic uh, chronology of events and things that have happened during the pendency of the, of the application. But we'd like to cover just a, a couple of other issues that that may be of importance to you in, in terms of you ultimately making a, a decision. Uh, this was an application that was heard, considered, and, and it was the 4-2 vote recommended for approval by Planning and Zoning Board back in, in March. Since that time, what we've done is, is revised the site plan. We've uh, revised the uh, letter of agreeable stipulations and conditions. Uh, we've strengthened uh, the dialogue established with uh, the, the residents, not only the Hayes Drive and King Springs, but also uh, Mr. Mayor, those uh, residents in, in DeForest Hills community as well. Um, 
Mr. Martin's correct, that meeting was, was last week and it was uh, attended um, by the residents I've just described. And of course, Mr. Hall was here and, and made a, a presentation with the change architectural style and, and stipulations. This is a small tract. It's a 2.2 acre uh, tract of land located on the east side of, of King Springs Road, and of course, on the south side of, of Hayes Drive. Future land use maps, suburban residential, so what we're doing is consistent with that. If you look at the densities in the area, and there's a, there's a staff analysis or general data summary in the staff analysis and recommendations that set forth the, the range of uh, units per acre or density of, of adjacent and adjoining uh, nearby residents, and it ranges from 2.52 units per acre up to 4.06 units per acre. Um, we are at a density of 2.27 units per acre, which is below that range. And also is a density that, that is not only consistent with, it, it comports with the, the R15 uh, zoning district. Since, since revising uh, the, the proposal, um, there are only two differences, and, and Mr. Martin's covered those, but just to reiterate, only two differences between what we propose uh, in the R15 district, and that is the request for a concurrent variance waiving uh, the uh, frontage for each lot from 85 feet, which your ordinance has for the R15 zoning classification, to an average of 61 feet. And staff supports that, and it's not often that staff supports uh, concurrent variances just because you ask for them. There, there's a reasoning for that. And of course, uh, Mr. Martin set forth that the, the uh, setback lots, excuse me, the setbacks with respect to the lots are interior to the subdivision, don't affect the outside. And so we are asking for a concurrent variance. All the lots uh, are above 15,000, ranging from 15,016 square feet to 15,720. So in all respects, except for those two concurrent variance requests, uh, this is an, an R15, uh, even it's called a, a conditional R15. Uh, we've established the dialogue with your professional staff. Uh, your planning and zoning board did, did, a, did a great job. Um, we didn't anticipate the, the public interest that was generated by this, but it was really a, a good wake-up call. Uh, for my client and, and for me and our, our engineer. And, and so what we've done since then is, is not just establish but nurture uh, the, the dialogue with the Forest Hills, Hayes Drive residents. And, and I would publicly like to, to thank them for the ar articulate, eloquent manner in which they presented their opposition in March. Uh, many times you get uh, unbridled, um, vehement opposition with, with no substantive basis for it. And in that particular instance is or that particular instance, they gave us direction within which to go, and we've received direction not only from your staff, but Councilman Stoner as well. And, and with the two, uh, the two times we've tabled it, it's really put us in a position so we think we've addressed and resolved um, what they were looking for. The, the stipulations that Mr. Martin um, referenced were agreeable to the special and the standard stipulations, but also we submitted before that uh, town hall meeting a, a stipulation letter dated May the 3rd, 2017. And, and submitted contemporaneously with that letter a revised site plan, which, which Mr. Martin has, has shown you and which is consistent with the, with the proposal. The houses will range from a minimum of 3,000 square feet up to 4,500 square feet and beyond price points beginning at 600,000 and upwards depending upon uh, the type of interior modifications, uh, renovations, not renovations, but modifications and upgrades uh, inherent to each individual. Uh, purchaser. The architectural style and composition to me is stunning. It, it, of course, what you've seen are architectural renderings. Um, that gives us an opportunity, if we're in substantial compliance with that, to, to, to review on an individual basis the, the houses as they come in for development by staff to ensure that they comport with what you've seen uh, and what the Forest Hills Hayes Drive residents have seen. Uh, in terms of parking, two-car garages, uh, limited, not limited, but ensuring that there's at least room for two vehicles to park there at all times. Driveways, uh, the length that the city requires is 22 feet with additional two spaces there. So there'll be ample parking without having to park any vehicles on, on Hayes or um, King Springs. The, there are a lot of stipulations and conditions, some of which are boilerplate, some of which are, are go beyond that. And one of those is to preserve specimen trees. I don't know if you've seen the property, but uh, there's some specimen trees on the property. Um, so every effort, now this is going to sound nebulous, but it's not. Every effort is going to be undertaken to save the specimen trees, um, which have not, uh, not already been designated by either our arborist or the, the city's arborist as dead, dying, or irrevocably diseased. Um, many times you'll see 
trees that are that are specimen trees, but they they are in in, in fact in in the process of, of dying. So um, that being the case, we'll follow your arborist recommendations with respect to those trees. But because quite candidly, and Mr. Hall would would, would speak to this as well uh, as well as his. Uh, a broker who's with him tonight, that adds value uh, to the property, to everyone and value to the neighborhood and, and to Forest Hills as well. Uh, we do have access to water and to, and to sewer that's covered uh, extensively, explicitly, and with specificity in the stipulation letter. There'll be sidewalks that we'll have on King Springs and, and Hayes as well. The, um, uh, we've put it into position so that the Ward Council uh, member, um, whether it's Mr. Stoner or later, uh, in, in case he decides he doesn't want to be in this position anymore, uh, whoever the council member is will have the authority along with staff uh, to make uh, minor modifications to the site plan, the stipulations, the conditions as it goes through plan review and, and thereafter. And when I say minor, I do mean minor um, changes. I want to thank the residents of, of Hayes Drive, uh, again, uh, the Forest Hills uh, folks, the community for their interest and participation in this process. As a result of their involvement, what, what they were able to do with us uh, and staff and Councilman Stoner's cooperation is really achieve an excellent template um, for these type of developments within a development uh, in order to gain continuity and consistency uh, within subdivisions that, that, are, that are primed or prone for a, a, a bit of redevelopment. So for all these reasons and because of the significant changes that Mr. Hall has made in concert with input from your constituents, Councilman Stoner's constituents, we do ask that you um, approve the zoning as presented to you tonight, Mr. Mayor and Councilman Stone. Uh, Mr. Hall and I are available to respond to any questions you may have at the appropriate time, sir. Does anybody else have any comments at this time? Oh, please come forward. <coughs> sure. Yes, this is a public hearing, so anyone wanting to speak in opposition to or wants to make public comment for this item will need to come forward now and be sworn in, and then we will call on you to speak at the appropriate time. Good evening. My name is Shantae Glover. I live at 1201 Kingsview Drive in Smyrna. Um, actually, I'm not in opposition. Um, I think it's a good idea to continue building in the area. Uh, I just had a question. So my home is directly behind um, the proposed lot with the four houses. And I just wondered if you had a better picture that could show me how far back the property line will go because there's a conservation area and then right behind the conservation area is my lot. So I just wanted to know how far back you would go into that area before you actually bump up against the conservation area. Could you tell me your address again? I'm sorry. Sure. 1201 Kingsview Drive, Shantae Glover. Yeah, you, you see where your deten the detention facility is and the uh -huh. open spaces? Yep. Um, if you go just to the south, that's where the conservation and the detention facility for Woodbury Place is located. Okay. So, um, so this will I be can't, open space with trees behind yes. the facility before it even gets to the right. conservation line. Okay. Okay. That's so I, I can't give you a distance on that. It may be just looking at it. It may be 100 feet to 150 feet. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, and Rusty on that real quickly. Obviously, to your point, you still have that buffer in the right. sense of that conservation area, uh, backing up to the retention pond area. Great, thank you, just a question. Have a good evening. I believe there's a question from a council member. Um, yes, my question is the about the stormwater management facility and um, when I compare it to the site plan that was approved with the, or at the uh, planning and zoning meeting and and how that's changed in terms of um, like, you know, how, where it's located or the maintenance of it and, and that kind of thing. And who would answer that for me? Um. The, uh, <clears throat> the stormwater maintenance uh, 
facility, stormwater management, water quality facility is positioned uh, where our engineer, uh, Jeff Smith of Ridgeline, in concert with uh, Eric Randall, um, your city engineer, have determined it's best. There is, uh, of course, site plan is not showing right now, but on the, the right or, or eastern side of the property, there's an access easement that, that allows uh, folks to be able to get down to it for maintenance purposes. So when you say get down to it, will, will there be like soil removed to, to create a, a bigger like retention pond area in that area? Because it looks like there's like topographically it kind of goes downhill anyway. So yeah, the, 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 it is that the natural contours flow uh, towards that position as Wilkinson. And um, there will be cut and fill. It will be created It'll be an earthen structure, uh, but it'll be created in, in accordance with your stormwater requirements. Um, Okay. And is it the same as it was before, or did that change with this it, new site? It's conceptual right now. Until you really go through full engineering on the site, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where that would be. But okay. conceptually, it's, it's where our engineers and, and your engineer have said it's appropriate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Just to reiterate what Mr. Sam said, this is a conceptual uh, plan. Once we get full hydrologies and understand the volume of water that needs to be detained, that'll determine the size of that detention pond. At this point, we're just more interested in make, making sure that there is adequate area left over to be able to accommodate that volume. And the city engineer believes we've got enough land to be able to do that. Um, okay. And then um, the maintenance of that stormwater facility would be um, like, who would be in charge of that maintenance? The HOA will be in charge of that maintenance. The city, prior to, to the issuance of the first CO, will require the developer to create an inspection maintenance agreement that will be recorded at Cobb County and will be associated with this plat. And that inspection maintenance agreement will outline all the, all the maintenance over the life of that detention facility. In addition, after, as we move through the, the life cycle of that, that detention pond, staff will be uh, inspecting that pond to make sure those maintenance requirements are being adhered to. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional comments at this time? Mr. Stoner, may I have a motion? Thank you, Honorary Mayor. Just very quickly before I do that, I do want to thank uh, Josh Hall, uh, working with the community. Um, as was mentioned, uh, there was a robust turnout at the planning and zoning uh, hearing back in uh, March. And I appreciate the fact that he was willing to sit down and meet with the neighborhood, the Forest Hills Preservation Group, and other citizens in Forest Hills, and uh, work through uh, some of the questions they have, some of the concerns, and I think uh, we came to a great in a sense, really a compromise that worked for everyone in the neighborhood and also for uh, the redevelopment of this property in a way that integrates it properly into the Forest Hills neighborhood. So again, I just want to thank you for uh, listening and being willing to uh, engage and participate. Uh, it was a good lesson. Hopefully, uh, other people can follow also as they uh, develop here in Smyrna. And we hope you continue to look at building in our community. I think you made an impression on a lot of folks in the neighborhood of the quality product that you're bringing uh, to Forest Hills. At this time, I'm going to make a motion for 4A 2017-105, zoning request Z17-005, rezoning from R15 to R15 conditional for the development of the five single family residence, 2.2 acres, land lot 527 at 1258 Hayes Drive, uh, Joshua W. Hall, an applicant. I have a um, question uh, real quick, and this is for Scott. Um, with the, the variance for the setback uh, from, you know, the, what the R15 is 80, and this is a variance allowing 55-foot uh, front setbacks, or the setback of the lot, um, does this set a precedence for um, the future for R15 um, developments in terms of allowing that um, narrow set, or, or the width of the lot, I mean, from 80 to 55? I don't think it would set a precedent that we had to necessarily follow. We've gone through the analysis here uh, to show how it's, it's required for this one development. So we'd do the same analysis with the other developments that came forward. 
Okay, thank you. Second. Oh, there is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please vote. The motion passes seven to zero. And at this time, I would like to quickly defer to Mr. Fennell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to take this moment. We have a very important person in the building, and I wanted to move an item up on the agenda to take advantage of his scheduling. Uh, so I move with the council's indulgence to move an item up in the agenda for taking item 6B next on the agenda. And it is my privilege to read 2017-184, approve the appointment of Tammy Sadler-Jones, formerly as the city administrator. She's been in an enacting capacity. Approval to enter into an employment contract between Ms. Sadler-Jones and the city of Smyrna and to have the mayor sign and execute all related documents. And I'd like to have uh, her spouse and the uh, VIP join us up front, if I could second. please. <laughs> Leland has an important date with Mr. Sandman here. We need to. <laughs> Continue. We have a motion on the floor. There is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please vote. The motion passes seven to zero. Congratulations. Yes. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Bacon. Thank you, each and every council member. Thank you, citizens of Smyrna. I also want to thank the staff. And last but not least, I have to thank my supportive husband, Lamar Jones, and our two-year-old son, Leland Jones, who has an 8 o'clock bedtime. So thank you very much for allowing us to move this item up. And to the citizens, you have my commitment to do my very, very best as your city administrator. So thank you very much. So now we'll return to the agenda. Item B is a zoning request for the rezoning from R15 to R15 conditional for the development of two single family residence, residences on 0.384 acres, land lot 664 located at 2611 Argo Drive by the applicant Anthony Lim. Is the applicant here? Awesome, okay. Will you please read the background, Ms. Sadler-Jones? Yes, thank you. Um, Anthony Lim is requesting a rezoning from R15 to RAD conditional for the construction of two new single-family residences at a density of 5.2 units per acre on an existing vacant lot located at 2611 Argo Drive. The zoning request was heard by the Planning and Zoning Board at the April 10, 2017 meeting and was recommended for approval by a vote of seven to zero. Community development recommends approval of the request, requested rezoning from R15 to RAD conditional for the construction of two new single family residences at a density of 5.2 units per acre with conditions. And again, um, Rusty, Plan Rusty Martin, pardon me, our senior planner is here to give additional background information. Ms. Jones did a great job of summing, summarizing the, the request up to this point, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. This is a three-tenths of an acre site. Uh, it's located on Argo Road, uh, just off of uh, Bates Street. Uh, the existing uh, zoning for the property is R15. 
the applicant is requesting to rezone the site to RAD conditional and build two single family homes. Um, as you can see, uh, the surrounding property is zoned R15. Uh, there is a little bit of R12 and RAD in the, in the approximate area, but all the other contiguous property is, is R15. This request is being accompanied by a land use change from suburban residential to medium density residential. Uh, suburban residential is under three units per acre. Uh, medium density residential allows uh, up to six units per acre. And as you can see, um, to the north, west, and south, the land use classification is suburban residential. Uh, the, to the, the properties to the to the east in the orange are medium density residential. Uh, so this would be a continuation of that, of that medium density residential uh, land use classification. Here's a proposed site plan. The homes will front on Bates Street with a, or Argo Drive with a, a little tag in on, on Bates Street. Uh, each home will have its own uh, driveway and the homes will, will have the following setbacks, a front setback of 35 feet, side setbacks of 10, and a rear setback of 30. There'll be a, a five foot sidewalk required along the frontage. And then these will be the individual uh, stormwater management facilities for each lot. And this is an example of the proposed homes for the area. This is the site. Uh, the, up, up in the left hand corner is the, the view from Argo. Um, the, the lower right hand corner is the view from Bates. And then the, these are um, the adjoining uh, properties to give you some context. Community development recommends approval of the rezoning of the property from R15 to RAD for two single family homes with following conditions from section 1201 of the zoning ordinance related to composition of the homes, stormwater management, underground utilities, traffic improvements, bearing of debris, tree ordinance requirements, and landscaping requirements. In addition to those standard conditions, we are applying special conditions. Uh, number 10 deals with the, the minimum front setbacks, which I read earlier. Uh, 11 deals with the minimum driveway length of 22 feet. Uh, 12 uh, requires a minimum lot size of 8,000 square feet. And 13 requires a minimum lot width of 50 feet. 14 uh, deals with the minimum floor area of 1,800 square feet for the homes. Uh, 15 is a requirement for the five foot sidewalk along Argo Drive. Uh, 16 deals with trees during the, the development phase. 17 ties the approval of the zoning to the site plan submitted. And 18 ties the zoning to the um, elevation submitted. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. This is a public hearing, so anyone wanting to speak in opposition to or wants to make public comment for this item will need to come forward now and be sworn in, and then we will call on you to speak at the appropriate time. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Thomas Starr, and I'm a adjacent property owner there in the back of it. And I was noticing the sign that where the zoning come up, it was facing Argo and Bates Street. Uh, I'm not in opposition of him building or, or any construction. My problem with, with him, I think the, their survey is wrong. Their survey has uh, jumped over my land and I noticed that they had, uh, they put up, uh, the last survey they'd done, they had put stakes in my yard. And I, I, I tried to call their, the survey that was done, the surveyor that was doing it, but I never got an answer. And uh, I was surprised that if they were going to do 
construction area looked like they would have came to me and tried to you know, talk about this thing. And I, and I can appreciate the, the, uh, the uh, building something in that area because we need it bad. And uh, I don't have no opposition to that. I, I just want the survey squared away. That's my only objection I have. Mr. Martin, do you have any, any insight to give? The only information I have is the survey that was submitted reflects what's recorded on the county tax plats. The signs are posted on the right-of-ways that the, uh, the property fronts, so I wanted to make sure we had a sign on Argo as well as Bates. Um, I'm sure that you may want to ask the applicant how he wants to handle this, but I'm sure they'd, be, they'd probably be interested in trying to figure out if there is a discrepancy at this point. Right, I would, I would think that that's definitely the case, and I think that it does need to be determined if there is a discrepancy. Now, when, when surveys are done, I know it, there are sometimes questions about the stakes. Are, are the stakes put in precisely on the property line? Uh, I mean, best of their knowledge right. is what's recorded um, with the with the county. I mean, they're exact coordinates, so I mean, right, they're, right. they're pretty precise. But you know, I don't know if there was a transaction for the property that abuts on Bates. I don't, I don't have those records in front of me. And I, you is, know, is the developer here? The property owner. Yes, the he is. Here. I guess that's my question. Is and and and. and in answer to, to some of it, and I'm, I'm not a surveyor, but I'm an engineer and have, have been around the survey business for years and years. Sometimes there's, there's what we term as offset stakes. Um, that's what I, that's what, that's and, exactly and what I was referring could be to. That the, the stake now, if the if the stake has property corner written on it, that's a different story. But sometimes a surveyor will set an offset stake to just to go back so it, that the, the exact corner is not. Um, it, even though it may be destroyed during construction or whatever, he's got a way of going back. Uh, but I would recommend that you still that we get it worked out with the surveyor before any construction began out there. Yeah, I, and, and the offset stakes are the, I didn't have the vocabulary for them, but that's what I'm referring to because that actually came up for a, um, a rezoning that we did over near the Five Points area near Williams Park and Rose Garden. And there were, there were some questions from a church that was located there because they, they saw the stakes and it, they were the offset stakes. But I do think that this is definitely something that we will get the answer to this question before any kind of construction begins. I, I've lived that practically all my life. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I was one of the first person that went to the school there. I know this land quite well. Right. And the property that he's uh, developing, I've never known it to be big enough to put a house on. The house that was on it, it was so small, but now it's talking about putting two houses on it. I don't see it, unless it's something that I don't know. And, and that property has never had an outlet to Bait Street. Matter of fact, my uncle is the one who cut the street in there, and I know it. I know it well. And the only frontage they would have would be Argo Street. Well, the, the, prop it, the property is, from what I see, saw on the site plan, will only be accessed by Argo, Argo Street. I mean, there, there you can see on the, the survey where there is, and it's, and it's clear on all the maps that we have in the city, there is a, a little dog leg that fronts Bates. It is... That's not right. That's, that's one of the main points that I'm complaining about. So you're saying there's not that, that dog leg doesn't exist? Okay. That's not right. Yeah, I mean, but the surveys and all the maps are pretty clear. Mr. Lim, do you have, I mean, I know that you've been, you're familiar with the property. Is there anything that you'd like to say regarding the property or the surveys? Good evening. Okay, actually, Could you please um, state your name? Oh, my name is Anthony, Anthony Lim. I live in Georgia. Okay, actually from the survey, 
it's been uh, done twice with different company and all both is coming with the same if you uh, got like a offset or something maybe we can talk later we, yeah. we, we can talk about it yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter <laughs> okay okay good mm -hmm. so anything else no. Thank Thank appreciate you. everybody. Mr. Thank Starr, are you comfortable moving forward with this? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to call on Mayor Pro Tem Council Member Terry Anulowitz. Yes, thank you. And I, I'm very glad that Mr. Starr came tonight. And I, and I do agree with what he said, that this is an area that needs some redevelopment. This has been a vacant lot for a while. I think that this is going to uh, definitely be an improvement to the vacant lot that is there right now. And so I'm happy to see this coming forward. I do want to make sure that Mr. Lim you, and you know, we'll, we'll all, I'll, I'll be, reach out to you, Mr. Sarr, because I do want to make sure that everything is settled before any construction begins with regards to the property lines. But at this time, I, I am comfortable going forward and making a motion to approve this item. What is, we are item uh, 4B, and this is the public hearing for zoning request Z17-007. It's a rezoning from R15 to RAD conditional for the development of two single family residences. It's a point, I'm sorry, 0 0.384 acres, land lot 664, 2611 Argo Drive. The applicant is Anthony Lim. Second. There is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please vote. The motion passes seven to zero. The next item on our, on our list is item C, which is a zoning request for the rezoning from CBD conditional to RAD conditional for three single family residences on 0.76 acres. Land lot 486 located at 3071 and 3075 Nickel Street by the applicants Rick Kolb and Kimberly Norwood. Are the applicants here? Okay, cool. Ms. Sadler Jones, will you please read the background? Yes, thank you. Um, Rick Cobb and Kimberly Norwood are requesting the rezoning of uh, 0 0.76 acres at 3071 and 3075 Nickel Street from CBD conditional to RAD conditional for the development of three single family homes at a density of 3.95 units per acre. The rezoning request was heard by the Planning and Zoning Board at the April 10th, pardon me, 2017 meeting and was recommended for approval by a vote of seven to zero with conditions. Community Development recommends approval of the rezoning of the subject property from CBD conditional to RAD conditional for three detached single family units at a density of 3.95 units per acre with conditions. And Rusty Martin will be giving the additional background on this item as well. Just to give you a little bit of background on, on this uh, zoning request, uh, this property was originally rezoned, I, I believe back in 2008, uh, from R15 to CBD for a parking area it was part of an assemblage they they had assembled six or seven lots um they wanted to to assemble and zone the parking area with the hopes of acquiring the corner lot on concord and medlin street uh, they were able to get that uh, zoning through and passed it was cbd conditionals for the parking area uh, the economy went downhill, the development never went through. So the site remained as is since that point. Um, in 2011, 2012, uh, the parcels that were part of that assemblage on McClendon were um, rezoned from CBD to RAD conditional for four single family homes. Uh, and then these properties were, were never developed or uh, rezone so they've sat in, in they've sat in their current state for the past 10 years uh, 
with that being said, I'll go through the request and give you some more background on the property. Uh, there's two single family homes with some accessory structures. The applicant is requesting to demolish those homes and build three new single family homes. And they're requesting the zoning change from CBD conditional to RED conditional. And as you can see on the map, the, the pink is the CBD and then the green is the RED conditional in the area. The subject property has a future land use designation of mixed use. That will not change with this request. Uh, single family homes are, are an acceptable use under that land use designation. Here's the proposed site plan. The proposed setbacks for lot one and two are a front setback of 25 feet, a side setback of 10 feet, and a rear setback of uh, 25. Due to the geometry of lot uh, three, they, they're requesting some variances with that. Uh, for front setback, 15 feet, a side of 10, and a rear of 20 to be able to fit the house in there. With this request, there'll be a 10 foot right of way dedication. Here are the locations of their stormwater management facilities. Here are the proposed home elevations, pictures of the subject site, and then adjacent properties for some context. Community development recommends approval of the rezoning from CVD conditional to RED conditional for three single family homes at a density of uh, 3.95 units per acre uh, with the following conditions. The standard conditions from section 1201 related to composition of the home, stormwater management, underground utilities, traffic improvements, street lights, tree ordinance, and, and landscaping requirements. In addition to the standard conditions, we're requiring some special conditions related to uh, number 10, which is minimum setbacks. 11 deals with the minimum floor area requirement of 1,800 square feet. Uh, number 12 requires a 10 foot right of way dedication along Nichols. 13 ties the zoning of the property to the site plan submitted. 14 ties the zoning of the property to the, the building elevation submitted. And that's all I have. At this time, I would like to call on Ms. Anelowitz to call on the applicant. Yes, thank you. Is the applicant here? Thank you. Would you like to be sworn in and introduce yourself? And you are not Kimberly Norwood. <laughs> I'm Rick Cole. <laughs> And really one of the only questions I had, because I think this is a, a very nice continuation of the residential redevelopment that we have seen in this part of Smyrna. I did have a question about the detention, as, particularly as it regards runoff into the, there's a uh, parking lot back there for the uh, yoga facility that uh, faces Concord Road. And I didn't know if you had any concerns or if you had any expectation that any stormwater from the property would run off into that parking facility. Of course, at this stage, we haven't done a detailed uh, grading and drainage plan, but our cursory look at it, the, the grades drain to the northwest corner, okay. which is why the individual uh, stormwater detention facilities are all kind of positioned on the north side of each home and a little bit towards the front or towards the west side. Okay. Um, so we, I don't think there's going to be anything running that way. If it, do, if it does, it would be more incidental. All right. Thank you. I believe Ms. Wilkinson has a question. I didn't, by the way, I didn't, I'm Sean Murphy, and I'm representing the applicant. I did the plans for the project. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, my question is, is sort of a question, maybe a legal question, but we have the site plan here that is um, 
it's uh, got a register registered signature from Sean, but I guess I'm used to seeing one from an engineer, so I'm just wondering, a registered engineer, or if that's an issue from a, um, you know, from the legal standpoint. No, it's not an issue. Sean's a registered landscape architect, so he's a registered designer in the state of Georgia. I just didn't know if it, with some of these issues that it required an engineering um, approval. Thank you. This is a public hearing, so anyone wishing to speak in opposition to or wants to make public comment for this item will need to come forward now and be sworn in, and then we will call on you to speak at the appropriate time. At this time, I would like to call on Mayor Pro Tem Council Member Terry Anulowitz. Thank you very much. And, and again, I do think that this is a, a good ex continuation of the residential redevelopment that we have seen in this area. Smyrna Heights, I guess this is specifically North Smyrna Heights, is an area that is experiencing growth. And I think it's only going to get better with the linear park as that comes online. There's a lot happening in the area, so I'm excited to see this. So this time, I am happy to move to approve item 4C. This is the public hearing for zoning request Z17-006 rezoning from CBD conditional to RAD conditional for three single family residences. It's a 0 0.76 acre track, land lot 486, 3071, and 3075 Nickel Street. The applicants are Rick Kolb and Kimberly Norwood. There is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please vote. The motion passes six to one. The next item is item D, which is a zoning request for the rezoning from NS conditional for the development of a 12,350 square foot daycare facility and a 4,000 square foot retail building on 1.9 acres, land lot 621, located at 4390 South Cobb Drive by the applicant Blastoff Construction Incorporated. Is the applicant here? Ms. Sadler Jones, will you please read the background? Thank you, Honorary Mayor. Blastoff Construction is requesting a rezoning um, for the subject property located at 4390 South Cobb Drive from NS Conditional to NS Conditional to modify the currently approved site plan and building elevations. The site would be split into two separate parcels with a daycare facility on one parcel and the retail building on the other. The first parcel will be 0.55 acres in size and include a 4,000 square foot retail building. The second parcel will be 1.39 acres in size and include a 12,350 square foot daycare facility. The zoning request was heard by the Planning and Zoning Board at the April 10th, 2017 meeting and was recommended for approval by a vote of seven to zero with conditions. Community Development recommends approval of the rezoning request for 4390 South Cobb Drive from NS Conditional to NS Conditional. And Rusty Martin is here to provide additional background information on this um, item. This is a, another one of the properties that we rezoned probably 10 years ago in 2007 and uh, is sitting vacant since that point. Um, back in 2007, they rezoned the property for, uh, from O&I to NS Conditional for the development of a, a 19,000 square foot uh, retail center. Um, there's been no movement on this on the site since that point. Uh, the applicant has since uh, gone under contract to purchase the site and build a new, and is proposing to build a 12,000 square foot daycare facility along with a 4,000 square foot uh, uh, retail building. The uh, staff thought the the proposed use change and the, the change in the site design was significant enough to take it back to PNZ for 
for a hearing and then subsequently back to you guys for an action. Uh, PNZ recommended approval of the request um, by an approval of 7 0. Uh, with that being said, let's go into the site plan. This is the currently approved site plan. As you can see, it was three retail buildings with, with associated uh, parking. This is the proposed building elevations for the, for the site. Just your standard retail design. Here's the proposed site plan for the applicant. As you can see, they'll, they'll come in off of one full access drive off of South Cobb Drive and then have parking um, on either side of the, the retail building and then on the, the south side of the property for the, the daycare facility. With this request, there are two variances, the first one being a reduction in, in minimum lot size from three acres to a half an acre, and then a reduction in the rear setback from 50 feet to 15. Um, the first variance is due to the, the plan to put a daycare facility on this site. Uh, right from the start requires that no daycare facility be placed on a property with uh, any soil contamination, which there is on the north end of the site next to uh, uh, the Chevron station. Obviously, the, those soils will be remediated, they'll be cleaned up and replaced. However, it impacts the, the, the daycare facility. So their proposal was to draw, um, parcel out that section, remediate it, and put an, another use on it. Uh, the second request from uh, setback reduction from 50, 50 feet to 15 feet, that is the same request that was approved in, in 2007. Here's the proposed property line that, that, that divides the property. The proposed building setbacks for the site are a front of 50, a side of 10, and a rear of 30 on the, on the retail site. And then on the daycare site, it's a front of 50, a side of 10, and a rear of 15. Here's the proposed stormwater management facility. It'll be located in the, in the play area underground. In addition, this site has um, some significant environmental constraints, one being a 20-foot drainage easement that runs through the site, and the second being a 20-foot drainage easement that, that bisects the site, and these are the locations of those easements. Here's the proposed building elevations for the daycare facility. Here's the subject site, and then, um, pictures of adjacent properties. Community development recommends approval of the rezoning from NS conditional to NS conditional for the daycare facility and retail building with the following conditions carried over from zoning case Z06-039. Um, changes to those conditions are highlighted in red, so I'm not gonna read all these conditions since they've, they've already, they're being carried over and just go over the ones that we ch we've changed. Uh, stipulation nine, we updated the, the site plan uh, to reflect the one that was submitted by the applicant. Number 10, we've updated the um, building elevations to reflect the ones submitted by the applicant. Uh, stipulation number 16, we've edited, it, edited that uh, requirement to an evergreen buffer um, and took out the requirement for Leland Cypress. Um, the arborist can decide on what, what's the appropriate evergreen screening for that side, but it, it must be in accordance with, with section 503. Everything remains the same for 17 through 21. Um, we are proposing getting rid of uh, stipulation number 22 um, that one is no longer needed. They are not encroaching in the stream buffer, which the original plan allowed for a small encroachment. Uh, we've added stipulation number 23 for, to emphasize the need for a 10-foot landscape buffer along the shared property lines 
with the uh, adjoining residential properties. Uh, number four, 24 requires an eight foot privacy fence along the shared property lines with the adjoining residential properties. And number 25 is a stipulation requiring that they meet all fire safety and access requirements and they must get approval from the city's fire marshal's office prior to the to issuance of a development permit. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, this is a public hearing, so anyone wanting to speak in opposition or wants to make a public comment for this item will need to come forward now and be sworn in, and then we'll call for you to speak at the appropriate time. Please have a seat, and at this time, I would like to call on Council Member Stoner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as was mentioned by Rusty in, in discussion, uh, this has obviously uh, been a piece of property that was zoned NS conditional and is still being zoned NS conditional. As was mentioned, uh, it's just the conditions have changed, and the reason for it was brought back to us for those reasons. Um, uh, after having some conversations, um, uh, concerning you know, the conditions and some additional ones, hearing from the neighborhood in the back, um, which, by the way, is not in the city of Smyrna, uh, just for everybody to understand. The residential neighborhood that's directly behind the uh, child care center is not in the city limits. But I did have a conversation with their HOA and uh, some concerns, and that's why I've requested at least an eight-foot fence for privacy reasons, uh, because that's going to be a child care, you know, outdoor play area, uh, and I would like to, you know, at least uh, for those neighbors, uh, at least give them some privacy uh, from the kids. Nothing against the kids. But uh, the reason the request was made uh, on my part, uh, even though the citizens are not in the city limits, they're Cobb County citizens, uh, I, I do not actually represent them, but I thought I was at least willing to listen to that issue and something we might be able to do, so that's why that condition was put in uh, at this point. Um, Rusty, real quickly, if you can come up and just let's clarify some things very quickly, if possible. Um, uh, just so everybody understands, the issue concerning access uh, is decided by the state in the sense of the uh, curb cut. Yes, That's it, is, not it is a state right away, so GDOT will control where the access needs to be. Um, they'll review and approve all plans prior to us issuing a development permit right. for the access point. Right. And to that, since they're, uh, you know, they have a right to have access to, uh, you know, obviously the property has a right to have access to the state highway um, and everything that obviously we cannot do in the sense at the end of the day, that decision is made by, uh, by the state highway. It's not our right of way and everything. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, I just want to make a few of those statements before I know we have some folks here who want to make some statements. I'm sorry. Yeah. And the applicant, I know, wants, wants an opportunity to get up and make some statements. So um, let me ask the applicant if she'll come first, because I think you also have some things you want to comment on. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. And please, uh, identif yeah, please identify yourself. I sure will. Uh, good evening, Mr. Honorary Mayor, Mr. Mayor, uh, and Council Members. My name is Ellen Smith. I'm an attorney with Holt May. Zach Coffin Wasserman, they haven't changed the name to Smith Law Firm yet, uh, but we're working on that. Uh, my address is 100 Gallery Parkway Suite, 1800 Atlanta, 30339. Uh, I do have the pleasure of representing the applicant this evening, Blast Off Construction, and Rusty uh, and the councilman have done a good job of setting the stage for you. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Uh, you have your staff's analysis. I agree with all of it with the, the exception of one point. Uh, which is the point that Rusty actually made when he stood up here. This is kind of the same story as the last application that you heard. This property was rezoned by an application that was brought in 2006, approved in 2007, and since then it has sat vacant and empty. And so the one piece of the staff analysis I disagree with is the position that the property has economic 
uh, benefit or use as it is currently zoned because it sat vacant for 10 years. So I disagree with that respectfully and request uh, this rezoning and site plan modification. Um, not to bore you with the details, this is essentially a down zoning. We are seeking a density that's about 15% less than what was zoned in 2007. Um, staff, line, staff has given you their analysis. I won't go through that. They have also highlighted all of the site constraints. Not only are there a number of easements that impact this property, it's a little bit oddly shaped. Uh, it also has a stream that is off-site, but the buffers are on-site, uh, so we are dealing with those as well. Um, Blast-off construction, which is the applicant, has worked with Legacy Academy on a number of child care facilities throughout the southeast. Just to give you an idea, it includes seven in the state of Georgia. This is not their first rodeo or their first daycare facility, uh, although it will be the first one in Cobb County and in your fair city. Um, it is an accredited uh, institution, and it has hours of operation from 6.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, not typically on the weekends. Um, and we intend to start uh, to stock the building and to build the square footage for up to uh, initially 169 children. The applicant has requested the right to subdivide the property uh, and there's a variance that goes along with that to reduce the size because this property isn't three acres to start with. We would never meet the requirement of the overlay district. So I uh, respectfully request that variance. Uh, Rusty is right when he mentions the other variance, which is reduction of 15, or excuse me, 50 feet down to 15 feet on one of the buffers or setbacks. That was improved in the 2007. I, I would tell you as a zoning lawyer that a variance that's approved runs with the property. Scott can certainly uh, take that position or disagree with me, but we respectfully request that you would renew uh, that approval this evening. Uh, we did have uh, approval at the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, we did have several folks who spoke in opposition. Uh, you will hear from some of them, it looks like, this evening as well. Their primary concern was traffic. Um, they also were concerned with landscape and buffers. And I did want to at least address that. Um, it's already been mentioned this is a state route. We do have a pending application with GDOT for a right-of-way uh, driveway permit. Um, just to put it in perspective, current traffic count put self caught drive at 38,300 cars per day. We are talking about adding about 200 trips. That's less than a half of a percent increase in the number of cars on this right of way. So I just wanna put that in perspective. No one's saying there isn't traffic, there is. That's where we are in life, notwithstanding the fact that I-85 has now reopened mercifully. Um, but given that we are in fact seeking a reduction of density in this application, I hope you will take that into account as well. Um, those numbers also don't include, include the fact that there are shared parent drop-offs, carpool, uh, potential for shuttle services and the like. Um, I did want to point out too, only because it's been a question, this property does not include, and this request does not impact or include in any way, the adjacent dentist office. Someone mentioned that at one point to me. I want to make sure you all know that's not part of this application. There is also only one access point to this property off South Cobb Drive. There is no access off of um, Cooper Creek or Ivy Glen. So that also was something that I think was misconception along the way. And I got phone calls from Cobb County and from everybody else about that. That's just not true. Um, we agree with uh, and appreciate staff's work on this. They have been extremely helpful throughout this whole process for the applicants since we started this process in early January. I want to say thank you to them. Uh, we agree with all of the conditions, most of which are from the 2007 rezoning, but we do want to clarify two of them. Uh, and if you would indulge me, I'll read them into the record, although I have provided them in writing to staff uh, and to the council member. Um, number 11, and, and both of these clarifications are really to reflect that we're going from a site plan that was purely retail to one that is retail and nursing, or excuse me, daycare facility. So it's not all retail. Uh, so number 11, uh, we propose B, retail truck deliveries shall comply with code section 46-1, that's your city's noise ordinance. Garbage, excuse me, garbage service to the property shall occur only between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. And then number 17 uh, dealt originally with HVAC units and required them to be all on the roofs of all the buildings. 
we just like to confirm uh, and rewrite it so that it says HVAC units serving the retail building shall be installed on the retail building rooftop. HVAC units serving the daycare facility building shall be installed behind brick enclosed screening, uh, br brick enclosures screening such units view from the public right of way and adjoining residential properties. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. At this time, are there any other questions for the applicant? Uh, real quickly, actually, uh, and Rusty, too, because we had this discussion. And concerning to 17, uh, the change, the issue is it's a pitch roof that we have on the daycare center. And so the idea would be to put those units on the ground, as you said, screened Correct. and everything. And that's the reason um, in the, our discussion uh, that you know, I'm open to that concept, um, since you're definitely going to screen it probably more than most folks do. I did bring photographs as well, should you like right. to see the ones that we've done in the past. Yeah, but now the retail center obviously will be on the roof. We are supportive of that right. request. Um, it, it accomplishes the same goal that we had, was, which is to screen it from the right of way and adjoining property owners. Right. And as to the issue, and, and Scott, maybe you can address this, to uh, number 11, we're obviously going to maintain with our uh, noise ordinance code, but the issue about garbage service to the property shall occur between 7 a.m. and 8, 8 p.m. Is there anything, the same thing, Rusty, if you want to comment on that issue? No, I, I think it just helps them clarify what, what kind of traffic and what kind of uh, deliveries are being done at what time. So it's not construed that kids being dropped off at 7 o'clock or 6.30 or not violating that requirement of the stipulation. Right. Yeah, I mean, is that the point? You want to make sure that it doesn't cover anything as yes. far as business operation? That's correct. Yeah, and it, you don't, I mean, that's not the intent, is it? That's not the intent of that. It was just purely for um, deliveries. Okay. Scott, do you have any issue with that? Is that? No, I don't think, I mean, are you clear with what the requirement? Yeah, it has nothing to do with uh, business operations for the daycare. It's just the, uh, the other things that I think this probably arose from uh, there were some centers down there that do deliveries have refrigeration trucks and stuff that are that come late at night and, and I think it was directed back then at that type of operation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to I ask anyone else who wants to speak to come forward. Please state your name, spell your last name, and state your address for the official records and what comments you have to make. Hi, my name is Nadia Rosen. Um, my last name is spelled R-O-S-E-N, and my address is 4349 Ivy Glen Court in Smyrna, Georgia. Um, I just have a question. Could I see, you have a thumbnail of the um, AC unit? It's the same photos that were at the preliminary hearing. Okay. And then so in terms of noise and things like that, do the brick create a barrier? I'm sure it would. I'm not a, a sound expert on HVAC units, but certainly moving in from the roof should be closer to any residential unit mm -hmm. than the ground. I would think it would block more than just open on okay, the roof. Great. But I think so, the intent originally was just to screen it aesthetically. Okay, sure. Yeah. The reason why I ask is because my unit is actually back, like it's directly behind where um, the daycare facility will be. So we're just concerned about the sound. Sure. Okay. And, and just a comment, I, I expect including the eight foot privacy fence and also they still have to have some uh, landscaping that should also help uh, muffle any noise there right. versus being on the roof. 
Yes. Um, is there any way, and I don't know if it's already created, is there a image that we can have of what that landscape plan would look like? I don't know if it's fully done yet in the sense of, uh, and that's part of the process that they'll be going through with our city staff to make sure they meet our requirements and standards. Okay, great. So, but that will eventually be, you know, obviously something that you can, as it gets to the point for them coming up with the final plan and design as a public document, um, and would be available from our community development department. Okay, great. And my last thing is, and we have a couple of neighbors here that also will speak. Um, for me, I would like to have a dialogue with the daycare facility. I'm not against it, actually, but you know, we really value our privacy. We value the trees that we have. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry. But um, you know, we value our privacy. We value the trees that are back there, and it's really important for us. Also, in terms of the students that will be at the daycare facility, it's probably good to have some space in between. So I just want to reiterate that and just let you know how important that is for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Short, so I'm going to lower it. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Johnny Hanks, and I reside at 4334 Ivy Glen Court. And... Uh, Kind of speaking on my own behalf, but after conversations with many of our neighbors, I think we have a lot of the same concerns, and we appreciate your time in listening to us this evening. Um, again, I'm speaking of many of the concerns that we have for myself and most of the neighbors, and really they uh, kind of group into four different categories, one being traffic safety, uh, secondly, protection of our property, overall safety, and conservation of some old growth trees there. So in regard to uh, traffic safety, while the notes from the previous uh, meetings on this have indicated that this project was zoned back in 2007, indeed that is true, um, however, I really don't believe that the current traffic volume or patterns have really been assessed. Ten years has brought a lot of growth, people, you know, prosperity and wonderful things to Atlanta and especially to the South Cobb Drive area. So I just want to make that point. Ten years does change a lot of things. Um, I believe we have some information I can share on the number of accidents in this stretch of roadway. Better? There we go. Um, uh, the stretch of roadway between the east-west connector and Cooper Lake uh, that demonstrates kind of the types and the frequency of accidents that are occurring. So in 2016, in uh, the entrance to our neighborhood, and I will point out that is the one and only entrance to our neighborhood, there were 25 accidents at Ivy Glen Drive. Uh, at the east-west connector, there were 266 accidents. And at Cooper Lake, there were 47 accidents. So you can see we are kind of sandwiched in between uh, a, a lot of retail and a lot of accidents and really a lot of energy that's going on in that particular area and just for us one way in and one way out. Um, also in regard to traffic we are concerned that there could be as many as 169 minimum drop-offs in the morning and in the evening at peak hours of traffic congestion and we are again concerned for our safety getting in and outside of our community during peak hours as well as other times of the day. Uh, protection of our property and safety. Um, we will be more visible now and we will be having direct access to our property. Uh, there's not the, the coverage and the brush of trees that really uh, shade us and give us protection from anyone really knowing that we're there. It's been a wonderful community to have been a part of for the past 20 years and we value, as some of my neighbors have said, just the privacy and um, the safety that we have enjoyed for that time and we really don't want to see that um, destroyed to any significant degree. Uh, our neighborhood is very buffered from access from walking traffic from South Cobb because of all those tree coverage and uh, it makes it very difficult for that foot traffic to enter, as I've said. Um, I also want to note, out, note that we also have several homeowners in the cul-de-sac that will be most affected by the development that do work from home. Um, again, I am probably one of those that's most affected as my property backs directly up to, to everything. Um, and finally, the, the tree conservation is, is extremely important to myself and our neighbors. And I'm particularly uh, concerned, as my property, as I mentioned, butts up against the project. 
Um, I personally don't feel that a 10-foot buffer is really adequate separation from the project and am concerned that my property values will be negatively impacted. Um, and there is one area of my property where it really is unclear where the property lines are actually located, and I just want to ensure that no trees that are on my property um, get taken down inadvertently in error. I know they've gone out and done some tagging with some orange strips, and um, Lee and I had some, or Ellen and I had some discussion. She was out at the property, property and trying to figure out what those orange strips meant, but I don't think we got a definitive answer on them. They don't appear to be strictly located around what I view as the property line. Some of them are go deeper into it. So I really am looking for some clarity there as well. So um, in summary, there are just a few things that we really would like the developer to make sure that he addresses to keep us as happy neighbors and uh, very supportive of, of projects going forward. And one that has already been mentioned is the eight foot, and I'm hoping it would be a wooden fence and not just a chain link fence. Um, to provide as much coverage as possible. Uh, conservation of as many existing trees as possible. Perhaps we can incorporate some of these old growth tall trees into the playground areas that are noted there. I think it'd be great for us, it'd be great for the kids, and um, a win-win for all. Um, I'm also looking for identification of exactly what trees that are at the top of the property lines that are going to be taken down. Again, I'm trying to avoid any of trees that are on my property being reduced in error. Thank you. Um, at this time, Ms. Wilkinson has a question for the applicant before we continue with other speakers. My questions um, had to do with a couple of things. Um, the, when the property was rezoned in 2007, um, it looks like to me the site plan included a, a shared access from the, the gas station, um, which has three entrances, two on South Cobb Drive and one on, um, I forgot what the name of that street is. Cooper. And, Cooper. But it does look like they had some shared access to this property. I so didn't I handle the 2007 zoning and I will be honest with you, I didn't study the 2007 site plan because it's kind of being thrown out the window. Um, there was, uh, I can tell you, uh, the same property owner owns two parcels that are adjacent to the gas station that do go to Cooper Creek Road. This is part of where some of the confusion, I think, about access to that mm -hmm. street came mm -hmm. from. Uh, originally, when the application was filed, it included an annexation application for those two parcels. Those two parcels are in unincorporated Cobb County. That okay. application for annexation was withdrawn uh -huh. um, because we can't, it's unusable property, and frankly, it's not wide enough mm -hmm. for an access point, uh, not at the Cooper Creek part of that property, but at the part that it touches the city of Smyrna property that is before you this evening. Uh, so I, I'd be anyway. happy, I know Rusty has the 2007 site plan, happy to look at it, but anyway, there I, is I, no proposed access except yeah. South Cobb Drive. Okay, yeah, I knew that anyway, that I had seen that it did include some shared access, I guess, through that um, gas station. The other thing um, that I uh, was also c looking at and concerned about was the um, safety from, well, there's two more things, but uh, fire truck um, turnaround to get it through the property and um, for public safety yes. reasons, and um, has that been looked at? Uh, those are ongoing discussions with the fire marshal. Uh, we provided turn, it, the site plan's gone through several different slight iterations since we filed uh, originally. Uh, we provided turn movements to the fire marshal earlier today uh, that showed hose layout and also access mm -hmm. to both mm -hmm. buildings for trucks, including turnaround. Mm -hmm. Okay, and okay, so and the, oh, go I, ahead. I should say there's also an additional condition. Obviously, we'd be required to yeah. meet any fire right. standards anyway, but just for clarification, mm -hmm. staff has added an additional condition to that end. Okay, thanks. And then the, um, the third thing that I was um, interested in, listening to the comments and the, um, the buffer that was provided, and I guess the way I'm looking at the property and it requires a 10-foot um, landscape buffer right. uh, around the uh, surrounding residential properties. And if we went back to the original zoning, I think I heard it was, uh, that was more. Uh, There's a 15-foot setback. 50 or 15? 15. 15. 15. When you say the original zoning, 
No, I'm talking about not the one in 2007, but the way. It was uh, different zoning classification, so then it was an ONI zoning classification. I don't know oh, okay. if it has the same restrictions. Well, and, well anyway, so what I, I guess what I'm getting at is when I look at the site plan where the buildings are going to go, and I know some of it is um, like, um, uh, I guess, play area and everything, Correct. but is there a, an option to keep some trees in that area on both sides I, to, to kind of accommodate some of those concerns? that I was hearing from the residents? I, I suspect, in all honesty, the answer is no, primarily because of grading issues. Oh. To ensure this, this property has significant to topography on it, mm -hmm. um, I suspect that the likelihood of maintaining significant trees, look, you're dealing with an unimproved parcel currently that mm -hmm. is a buffer between South Cobb Drive and Ivy Glen. Mm -hmm. it's, un it's a buffer because it's just undeveloped at this point. The 2007 zoning allowed for the development of the property, including a 50-foot buffer in some instances, but including the 10 or 15-foot setback mm -hmm. uh, and others, and it did not require a landscape buffer. Um, we have added, maintained the 15 feet along the one property line adjacent to Ivy Glen and added the requirements for the landscape buffer. Certainly, mm -hmm. nobody wants to cut down trees if they don't have to, but at the mm -hmm. same time, I think I'm not going to stand here and say every tree on the property will remain. I understand. I was just looking at the, the land that was you know, still there around sure. the building. And I, just I will also it. say I'm, I'm not a uh, guru on it, and, and Frank Turner, uh, who is here this evening with me, uh, and I apologize if I forgot to introduce him, but he is here with me from Blast Off, uh, could probably speak better to it, but there are state requirements with respect to the parking. Um, parking. Uh, the playground areas, mm -hmm. and I, I know, for example, they have to be grassed. I don't know what the requirements are with respect to trees, uh -huh. so he would have to meet those requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. I believe we have another question. While you're still there, I'd love to ask a question. Certainly. Glad to see you here. Um, the obvious uh, answer, I'm sure, is uh, available to everybody just by seeing it, but there's a need since we have more and more growing families moving to Smyrna, there's a great need for daycare. Does, uh, does your uh, uh, owner have uh, statistics that bear out what seems obvious? That's a good question whether he has statistics that he's willing to share or not. Um, <laughs> but I will say at the Planning and Zoning Board, there are actually two or three uh, folks that stood and said, bring it, we need more daycare. Um, which is sort of rare for a zoning attorney to have anybody in support of an application that you didn't know was coming. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head. Well, just statistics. as an observation, you know, s the city of Smyrna's age has been declining uh, because we are enticing more and more young families and they are reproducing and bringing more Smyrnans. And I would be remiss if I didn't invite those neighbors along Glen Ivy, Ivy Glen, uh, to, to join the city. Many of them are. Uh, have elected not to uh, approach the city to be included in the city and we'd love to invite them to do so. I think the benefits of being in the city and being a part of our conversation on a regular basis and meeting these needs on a regular basis and our number one line item in the budget is public safety so rest assured that is very important to all of us and if there are ways we can continue to help to do that we want to do it. Thank you. Um, are there any future plans to purchase the dentist office? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and then also in terms of, you know that you make a right turn into Ivy Glen. Is there any plans or any way that we can talk about some kind of protective barrier? Because right now we have people coming straight through that area and that has caused accidents in our neighborhood. And so we're concerned about having that same thing occur with children and with the daycare. Um, is that something that can be discussed or is that, is there any room for discussion? I'm not, I'm not the city DOT, so. No, I know, but just, well, that's just gonna be I, as a community member. Just on member. that issue, that's gonna be a discussion with state DOT. Okay. At the end of the day, that is their right of way, that is their decisions to make. And that's a good question, I'm not saying you're concerned, but unfortunately we don't have any say so this is something we should reach out to GDOT. I would suggest you reach out to GDOT okay. on it. Is there right away so they make those determinations? Okay, thank so. you. You're welcome. And, and we've got some other folks that were sworn in that need to come forward and 
and make your comment. Okay. We, does someone else want to? Okay. We just want, yeah. Hi. This is really embarrassing. Um, I'm Lee Hodes. I live at 4378 Ivy Glen Way. I want to uh, thank everyone that's gotten all our calls because I know several people have dealt with our neighborhood and our concerns, um, especially Councilman Stoner, Mr. Stoner. Thank you. Um, we actually have signatures here from the neighbors that couldn't make it because they want to make sure that their concerns are noted. That's not just those of us that showed up. We get growth. We understand growth. We just want to be heard. We want to make sure the kids are safe. We want to make sure we're safe. We want to make sure our property value doesn't go down. Yes, we're not in Smyrna. We're in Cobb. <laughs> we, we appreciate the offer, you know. But, but um, you know, we if our property value goes down, it does. It affects everyone along Smyrna, and we don't we don't want that. And we. We moved to that community for the peace, for the quiet, for the happiness. Now we play a game of Frogger every time we leave. And uh, we mentioned all the accidents. And it comes down to literally, I did all the math, for a .4 miles, it's 23 accidents a month in a .4 mile radius. Like a little stretch of rope. It's 23 accidents a month. We have photos here that we'd like you to look at of accidents that have occurred recently in the past two months. And one of them did involve a child and the child is crying and the father is holding him. We don't want that to happen. Nobody wants that to happen. We also didn't know if it was possible. We know we get the, G, you know, the Georgia Department of Transportation. I've spoken to them, poor guys. Um, we just didn't know if it was possible for Blast Off or Legacy to help out. Like I've seen different um, businesses actually address their traffic concern and maybe have a traffic patrolman to go out during the heightened period to try to make sure everyone's safe. I don't know if that's a possibility. I don't know how that would be addressed, but considering the frequency of accidents, 23 accidents a month, that teeny stretch of road, that that is a major concern. And we don't want to play Frogger, especially with children. I mean, you know, parents have screaming kids in the car. They're not going to be paying attention. I've had people say, well, you're just going to have to drive more carefully. If anyone has kids, I don't, I have dogs. But if anyone has kids, <laughs> I've seen the parents in the car, you know, about ready to pull their hair out. I've seen the parents with the screaming kids. I've seen the parents reach behind to give them food, to give them, you know, an iPad, whatever it is. They're not paying attention. So it's everyone else's job to watch out for the ones not paying attention. And being that you're the government of Smyrna to represent all the people in Smyrna and those of us that are not, as you said, yet, um, to make sure that those parents that are ready to scream, that need a drink, that just want to go home safely, you guys are doing your job to keep them safe. So I don't know if you guys want to look at what we have written down, look at the photographs of the accidents here. They're in two different areas, not just one area, it's two different areas. One is right in front of our neighborhood. And actually look at the signatures of people that did not make it tonight here, not because they got in an accident. Oh. You want to give them this to you? Yeah, oh, please hi. do. I think I everybody on council has kids, so we yeah. understand the, the need for uh, being safe. Appreciate and, that. Yeah, okay. and I, I, have, I, I definitely understand your concerns, and I appreciate you taking the time to come here tonight because I know that it's not as easy as it, as it looks to people who sometimes think, oh, you just go to a council meeting. But I do want, I mean, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, are the traffic concerns different for this use than they would be for any other use at this location? It will, I mean, it's been vacant for, I think it's been for sale for 10 years and what, vacant for 30 years? It's, we, we've enjoyed that. Right, I mean, but who, who wouldn't, and we get, we get growth. We understand growth, right. but it is, we are in a unique situation that our neighborhood is surrounded by driveways and businesses. I mean, it, it is, so it does make it hard to go in and out. It's, it's scary to go in and out, it really is, because we know everyone's on their phone, no one's paying attention. So we get, and we, we're glad that it's okay, at least some of the businesses on the property aren't gonna be open for the weekend. Yay, that's a little safer for us on the weekend. But what about, I mean, I don't know if the academy is going to have um, graduations, if they're going to have events. There's roughly around 40 parking spots, 169 kids. Rusty informed me. It's, it's nine kids, I guess, per parking spot. What about staff? What about retail? What about, you know, um, if there is a graduation, if there's two parents that come? How's that traffic going to affect that small parking lot? Because, again, there's concerns with, 
uh, the fire trucks going in and out. I mean, there's just a lot of concerns that we have and we get that's gonna be there. We just want everything covered. We want, you know, all the I's dotted, the T's crossed, you know, a bar set up so we can, you know, drink away our stress. But, um, you know, we just want things like that addressed. Is it gonna be kids dropped off? Are people gonna have to park to get their, you know, bring their children inside? I mean, it's just a lot of questions we have and we just wanna make sure it's set up because we also don't want our streets lined with cars. We don't want people turning around in our neighborhood, which they already do because we've almost been hit. I do talk a lot. Okay, we've almost been hit leaving our neighborhood when people do a U-turn because they can't make a left out of wherever they're coming, whatever driveway, so they'll make a right, turn into our neighborhood, do a U-turn, and continue on their merry way. So we just wanna figure out how all those concerns are gonna be addressed. And, and we're, you know, obviously we're aware of those issues and concerns, that, you know, anyway because under our ordinances and our codes and everything else in the sense of the number of parking spaces the ability for egress and ingress and also the issues concerning the public safety um, in the sense of our vehicles and access obviously we take those in consideration under ordinances on the end of the day in the sense of traffic we can't say no to a zoning just because of traffic there's a lot of different factors but at the end of the day that's that that issue alone is not an issue to say no. And the property has been zoned as long as it's been zoned, even though it's, you know, and it's always been a generally commercial office or industrial site. So, you know, hopefully we can ameliorate as much in the sense uh, to the neighborhood from our side, and obviously the privacy fence, the landscaping uh, buffer that's been put in, uh, that's being, you know, required to be put in. We'll try to ameliorate some of those issues in the sense of your neighbor versus some other type of business. So, you know, at one point there was talk about putting a oil change place there. Uh, obviously, we're not, that's not happening now. So the point is, I, we hear you, um, but at the same time, we have limits on what we can say yes and no to. And also, we're dealing with a state highway. So as we discussed before and everything, but I appreciate you coming out tonight and letting us know and providing that information to the council members. With the, um, with the traffic, like a, mm -hmm. a traffic policeman, would that be whose responsibility if that is even something that could happen because people ride that suicide lane it's called suicide lane for a reason, like it's a regular lane. So that, I doubt that would be, we could require that would be something up to the property owner, and at that point they would have to come to the city to have a discussion, and also you've got the state, you know, it's a state highway again. So in the sense of us making that requirement, that's, that's not a possibility on our end. I assure you they want to be safe too. Uh, the last thing they need is a fatality uh, involving children. So yeah, they're, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be that there. way. Yeah, I've seen cars flip there. And nine years ago, there was a really bad accident that the person was drastically injured and had to have a talk with the Georgia Department of Transportation because it was that bad of an accident. So it is a major concern for all of us. But I guess, I mean, those are all our concerns. You guys hear them. And we, again, we're not opposing it. We just want everything to find a solution that everyone's happy with. I guess they say if both sides feel like they had a little bit of a loss, both sides are winning. I guess you're never going to get both sides completely happy. So thank you guys for all listening. Um, did I hear you say there will be a ACL cell lane into the uh, center from South? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know yet that GDOT is okay. reviewing the application. Okay. All right. Thank you. Was there someone else? I, th I think. Someone else that wanted to be sworn in real quickly to make a comment. I know there's some other folks are sworn in if they want to make their comments too, but someone else. Hi, and everyone. Go ahead. And I will say, before we get started, those who have not, who got sworn in, unless you, I don't want to say that you can't get up and speak, but if we've covered the same subject matters, yeah, okay, I just want to make sure, I just want to make sure you feel you got your opportunity. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. I raised my hand when Mr. Fennell spoke about parents. I am a parent. And please identify oh, yourself sorry. and where you live. My name is Jessica Ludolph. I live on 3769 Wakefield Hall Square, right off of Atlanta Road um, in Smyrna. And I'm a parent. I have two daughters, four and one. And when I was pregnant with my four-year-old, I could not find a quality daycare in Smyrna. I was on five wait lists. And I did not get a spot until she was two years old. So um, I just wanted to speak quickly as the voice of a parent. It is a growing community. I have many neighbors and friends that have young children or are pregnant and they cannot find a daycare. So I am excited and would welcome a new quality daycare that could relieve some of these lengthy lists 
um, and I support this. Thank, Thank you. you. At this time, are there any other additional comments that would like to be made? Hello, my name is uh, Ray Rasha. I reside at 4379 Ivy Glen Bay, Smyrna. Uh, I just would like to voice my concern. Uh, it would be more of the same because my uh, neighbors, they have you know, said whatever they have said so far, they are my concerns. But the most important thing that I've noticed about this development would be the daycare. Uh, because of the amount of accident that I, I am seeing every day from Cooper Lake up to uh, Mm, East West Connector, I do not see the daycare as a great idea and development in that neighborhood because of the safety for the children. That is my most, I'm most concerned about this, uh, this problem. Just uh, don't want to take your time more than this. Uh, I, I would be opposing to this development. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments? Mr. Stoner, may I have a motion? Yes, I'm going to make a motion, but with that motion, I want to make uh, some changes to stipulation 11, stipulation 17 as part of my motion that we discussed. And I'll, I'll read those in as part of the motion um, very quickly. Um, so, okay, 4D 2017, I want to make a motion, excuse me, for uh, 4D 2017 135. Zoning request Z17-004, rezoning from NS conditional to NS conditional for the development of a 12,350 square foot daycare facility and a 4,000 square foot retail building on 1.9 acres, land lot 621 at 43, 4390 South Cobb Drive, uh, the applicant being Blast Off Construction Incorporated. The uh, changes I want to make in the stipulations is stipulation 11 to read. Retail truck delivery shall comply with code section 46-1. Garbage service to the property shall occur only between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. And then stipulation uh, 17, HVAC units serving the retail building shall be installed on the retail building rooftop. HVAC units serving the daycare facility building shall be installed behind brick enclosure screening such units view from the public right away and the adjoining residential properties. Second. There is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please vote. The motion passes seven to zero. It, just real quickly, I do want to thank you all for coming out. And uh, our, our invitation still stands. <laughs> We'd like for you to join the city and everything. My, uh, my neighborhood is off Cooper Lake Road, too, a little further to the west. And we joined the city as a group as the homes were being built. We now are 955 home community off Cooper Lake Road, and we're thrilled to be in the city, so we welcome you to join us. Item five is privilege licenses, and there are none. I, for item six, item B is a public hearing and presentation of the proposed budget for the fiscal year of 2018. Ms. Sadler-Jones, will you please read the background? Yes, uh, prior to the adoption of the fiscal year 2018 annual budget, uh, we have scheduled public hearings. Um, this is the first pu public hearing. Kristen Robinson, our finance director, and Jared Sigmund, our budget officer, will be giving tonight's presentation. Um, our next public hearing is going to be on Wednesday, May the 17th at 12 noon in this exact room, the council chambers. And so I'm going to pass it over to Kristen and Jarrett for tonight's presentation. Thank you, Ms. Sadler-Jones. The uh, 2018 fiscal year will start July 1st of 2017 and it will go through June 30th of 2018. The total proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year is $92,365,507. We started back in November with our capital budgeting process, and uh, since then the departments have submitted their operating budget requests. We've had a series of budget meetings and negotiations with finance and administration, ultimately cutting about $4.8 million from the original requests. Just to give you a little bit of context for the budget number for FY18, uh, we've thrown it up here in this table compared to the FY17 revised budget numbers. And you can see the general fund, for instance, uh, 
is uh, proposed to be up 5.1% from the prior year. Special revenue funds are up 10.9%. Capital project funds are down quite a bit, 31%. That is uh, almost entirely due just to the timing of different SPLOST projects. The internal service fund uh, is up 35.9%. That is our vehicle replacement fund. And enterprise funds are down 16.7%. So the FY17 revised budget was $101 million, and that's compared to $92 million for the upcoming year. We also wanted to compare the revenues and expenditures for FY18, and you can see those here. For the general fund, it has to balance, and the revenues and expenditures are balanced at $47.3 million. And in the other groups of funds that you see there, you can see they are all transferring to cash reserves. So that is good news for FY18. General fund revenues, again, are at $47.3 million with uh, the over half you can see in that chart there uh, made up by property taxes. That's actually about 56%. And then the other sources of revenues that you see in the general fund are charges for services, other taxes, licenses and permits and various miscellaneous sources of revenue. In terms of budgeting for these, we looked at historical actuals, we looked at uh, year-to-date collections, and then we sought the input of our department heads for any other factors that may indicate an increase or decrease in the revenues. I indicated our property tax revenues are uh, making up about 50%, 56% of our general fund revenues and um, you kind of see uh, in this slide the net property tax digest. That is the total value of all real and personal property in the city, less any exemptions. So this is the value that is multiplied by the 40% uh, of the fair market value. And then it's multiplied by the millage rate of 8.99 mils. Uh, we have been able to balance our budget uh, using the same low millage rate of 8.99 mils for the last several years, since 2007, in fact. We are basing this on information from the uh, Cobb County Tax Assessor. Cobb County Tax Assessor. Uh, and <laughs> um, a little nervous, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> that comes later. <laughs> That's when we get back. Uh, the Cobb Assessor has um, done a commercial revaluation of all commercial properties across the city. That's for every commercial property. Uh, we have also uh, seen a revaluation of some residential properties in the city. And as a result of that, based on the Assessor's recommendation, we are recommending uh, an 8% increase in our tax digest. Uh, and you can see sort of the trend of the tax digest over the last several years. Uh, you see the decrease there with it really bottoming out in 2013 and then uh, increasing since then. Uh, tax year 2017, fiscal year FY18, uh, will be our largest uh, tax digest to date. General fund expenditures do balance at $47.3 million. Uh, as was indicated earlier, public safety does make up uh, about 30% of our general fund expenditures. It's the largest portion. And then in uh, roughly equal amounts, you've got general government services, public works, and then health insurance and other benefits uh, also uh, contributing to that. Debt and capital projects are in here as well, and we will touch on those later in this presentation. The E911 fund is one of our special uh, revenue funds. It is uh, proposed at $1.69 million this year. And uh, it's a bright spot for us. Since it was established a number of years ago, this fund has historically required a subsidy from the general fund in order to meet its expenditure obligations. Uh, our police department has been very diligent in uh, coming up with ways to make that self-sufficient and they have uh, been working with the city of Powder Springs on a new business agreement with them that would provide 911 services to that city. So that's not quite finalized yet, but uh, if that agreement goes through, we will 
need to hire four new communications officers in our E911 center. Uh, so those will be some additional expenditures, but uh, the new revenues from that agreement are expected to fully make up uh, that difference. And in fact, uh, balance this fund for the first time since its history. Another bright spot in our budget is the Hotel Motel Fund. Uh, and it's been a bright spot. Tourism is the number one industry in Cobb County. Uh, and that was before the Braves came to town. So we do expect this to uh, increase. The largest revenue stream for this fund is a tax on room nights occupied in Smyrna hotels. So we're not anticipating a big spike in this number because um, we would need additional hotel rooms to really see that increase. We are expecting some increase, however, uh, and this fund is, is doing just fine. It's expected to transfer over a half million dollars to the general fund in addition to transferring $30,000 to cash reserves. Moving on to the water sewer fund, we are looking at revenues of $19.3 million. Uh, that includes $18.5 million for water and sewer usage. Those are uh, the collections we receive from our customers. We also receive some revenues as a result of development impact fees throughout the city. And then on the expenses side, uh, you can kind of see uh, the different breakdowns of expenses there. Uh, I would say the biggest increase on the expense side is probably wholesale water, going from about $10.4 million in FY17 revised to about $10.7 million in FY18. We've also got almost $3.5 million of expenses planned for the water sewer capital project fund. And then debt obligations make up a small percent as well. Really the story here is that this fund is expected to contribute $600,000 to cash reserves and that's coming on the heels of our using about $4.8 million from reserves in FY17. So uh, just one year later we are already expecting to begin restoring uh, those uh, funds that we had to take from reserves in the current fiscal year. Moving on to the General Fund Capital Improvement Plan, or CIP, we do schedule this uh, over five years. You can see uh, we actually only budget the upcoming fiscal year, and that's just over a million dollars for FY18. And then looking at kind of what's coming down the pipeline, you can see that we've got a couple of pretty big years coming up. Um, I will say at this point we are optimistic that we will see a pretty good surplus for the current fiscal year. Uh, and we are hopeful that we'll be able to commit some of those funds to uh, future capital projects. The next three slides sort of list all the general fund capital projects that we are proposing for funding in uh, fiscal year 18. I'm not going to read through all of these, but I will point out a couple. You see $85,000 there for self-check kiosks and RFID conversion. That's at the library. If you have been there lately, you may have noticed uh, the kiosks are actually already there. That was funded as part of the current fiscal year. So you uh, can take advantage of those self-check stations right now. The RFID component will be added in FY18. And so that will uh, speed up the process for patrons looking to check out their books. And it will also uh, help with staff as they manage their inventory. I'll also point out on this, side, on this slide $50,000 for sports field renovations. That is specifically for field improvements at Brinkley Park and Tolleson Park. On the next slide, I'll mention the police storage facility for $50,000. We were initially thinking we have to construct a brand new building behind the police station, but uh, it turns out we were able to uh, come up with a plan to retrofit the front office space in the city record building that is on Atlanta Road, sort of between the community center and uh, the police station. So we'll be able to take advantage of that. And as a result, it's uh, a less expensive project. The other benefit there is that we can stop uh, spending money for the offsite storage as we are currently doing. And in this last slide, uh, I'll mention the roof repairs and replacements for $150,000. That is for the community center and for the police station roofs. Uh, those will ultimately have to be replaced, and when they do here in four or five years, those are big ticket items. Um, so <laughs> we're pushing those off for a few years, and we are optimistic that these roof repairs that we make in FY18 will get us a few more years down the road 
and allow us to sort of build up our reserves in anticipation of those big expenditures. Altogether, it's 20 new projects in the general fund CIP totaling a little over $1 million. We also have capital projects in our enterprise funds. Uh, you can see the schedule here. Uh, we always have infrastructure and drainage projects in our water sewer CIP. Uh, this year, we are also adding uh, the first of a four-year project to replace our water meters and dials. You see that's $880,000 per year for the next four years. That is an expensive project. That equipment uh, has a lifespan of about 15 years, and the equipment we've got right now is uh, due for replacement. Uh, the good news is um, we don't have to take on new debt to do that. We're expecting to be able to pay for that expense with cash from our, um, from our utility operations. So the water sewer CIPs at three and a half million dollars. We also budget money every year for capital projects to maintain our stormwater infrastructure. Vehicle replacements and additions are kind of another form of capital projects. And we've got several that are proposed for FY18. Uh, we are adding a second heavy rescue truck to our uh, inventory of fleet fire. Uh, administration is going to be getting that heavy rescue truck in fire station four and along with that truck we're also going to be recommending six new firefighters to uh, help staff it so that will sort of mirror the service that we already have in uh, in service at fire station number one so between the heavy rescue at one and station four those two rescue trucks will handle all of our medical calls throughout the city that is the only vehicle addition. Uh, the rest of these are replacements of existing vehicles. Uh, as you go down the list there, the big number that jumps out at you is $820,500 for six vehicles in water distribution. I'll just note that most of that, about $675,000, is for two sewer vacuum trucks. So that's taken up the bulk of that expense. Altogether, it's 16 vehicles at almost $1.3 million. That is an increase over the $949,000 that we budgeted in the current fiscal year. Uh, and with that increase, we are uh, planning to use about $180,000 from funds previously committed to help cover that expense. I wanted to touch on debt obligations. We've got about $66 million worth of total outstanding bond debt. Uh, those issuances go back to 1997, I believe, and they've allowed us to do a number of different things like invest in our downtown and uh, develop new parks and redevelop blighted property. Uh, of that $66 million, we expect to pay down about $4.5 million in the upcoming fiscal year, most of that from the general fund, and then about $250,000 from previously committed funds. Uh, I'll also note a different kind of debt is capital leases, and FY18 is the last year we'll have to uh, pay a payment on our Johnson Controls meter reading equipment from 2004. We have a number of proposed fee changes. I'm not going to go through most of these. They're in our budget book. There are a lot of them. Um, I will point out that... Um, the water sewer uh, division will be updating its fee schedule to reflect the fees that went into effect in March of this year. That's a pass through from advanced disposal. Uh, excuse me, that's the sanitation fee that went into effect in March. Uh, the fee schedule that we're updating for water sewer went into effect in January of this year. Uh, and that's a 3% uh, pass through from the Cobb uh, Marietta Water Authority. We're also proposing a 50 cent increase for the Stormwater fee, it's a monthly fee of $2.45. We'll be increasing that to $2.90 in an effort to cover our uh, capital obligations uh, that are coming uh, in future years. The department submitted 26 new personnel requests in our budget process. And this budget includes 20 of those positions. Um, and I will go through them on this slide. We are proposing four communications officers in our E911 fund. I mentioned those earlier. That's in association with the new business that we expect to be doing with Powder Springs. Uh, fire prevention is requesting an additional inspector slash investigator to help with annual inspections. Fire response is adding six new fire trainees. Again, those go along with that heavy rescue truck that we mentioned earlier. 
Human Resources has asked for a risk coordinator to help manage some safety programs and reduce our workers' compensation claims and property and liability claims. Parks Department will be getting a new maintenance technician. This is because not just rentals that have increased, but also we are adding the Reed House, which is uh, the historic property on Atlanta Road the city purchased and is renovating for use as a special events facility that will be operational in FY18 and will require additional staff support. And then you see between recycling and sanitation, five new crew workers and a truck driver. Those are necessary due to growth in the city. The good news is the new customers will be enough to pay for those new positions. And then traffic engineering has asked for a new crew worker to help with uh, maintaining traffic signals and especially street signs in the city. So altogether, we're looking at 20 positions to save some money in the next uh, year's budget. We are budgeting these at uh, either one half or three quarters of a fiscal year with the total budget impact being $737,000. There are a number of other personnel requests that are recommended uh, in this budget as well, including 18 position reclassifications that come with a $71,000 budget impact, as well as a paramedic supplemental pay increase. That will be 2.5% uh, pay increase for all existing paramedics and then a 5% increase for new paramedics. The goal here is to make us more competitive with our peers in the marketplace as well as uh, reward and really incentivize our staff to take on what is uh, a very rigorous training program to get that paramedic certification. That comes with a budget impact of about $89,000. We are also proposing a class and compensation study at about $15,000 to be performed in July. Uh, with possible implementation of new salary tables in January. We have budgeted $613,000 in general fund contingency. That does include uh, an estimated $50,000 to bring uh, affected staff up to the minimums of those new salary ranges uh, that might go into effect as a result of that class and compensation study, as well as $280,000 for merit increases. Um, merit raises uh, in January should council choose to adopt those as they have in previous years. I also wanted to mention health insurance. That's a big item in our budget at $4.9 million. It is an $820,000 increase over the prior year. That's 20% over FY17 revised budget. I will note that of that $820,000, about 180 dollars of it uh, is due to new personnel requests. Um, now we, we want to strike a balance here, right? We want to provide a good benefit to our employees, but we also want to manage these costs. So we've been attempting to do that over the past few years. We've been gradually reducing the employer contribution to premiums, as well as doing things like raising deductibles, raising copays, and taking other measures to reduce our costs. A couple of other highlights I want to finish with. Uh, one is a $100,000 transit feasibility study. Um, our council has already been collaborating with federal, state, and regional partners, and they are fully supportive of it. That's the good news. The better news is that this is a matching grant. So for our $100,000 contribution, we will leverage an additional $400,000 of federal funding to help accomplish this. Another source of federal funding is the Community Development Block Grant, and we expect to have about $325,000 at our disposal this year. That money will be used for improvements at Jonquil Park, Ward Park, and Chuck Camp Park. Uh, and a portion of those funds are also used to fund the salary of our Ward 5 Code Enforcement Marshal. You can find a copy of the budget book on our website. We've got a link to it on the home page. Uh, you can see it there circled. It says FY 2018 Proposed Budget. I will also point out on this page at the top right, you can see uh, a link to financial slash budget. If you click that, you can see not just the proposed budget book, but uh, copies of previously adopted budget books. You can also find our contact information for reaching out to us. If you have any questions or comments about this budget book, please feel free to do so. I'll end with this slide, which uh, Ms. Sadler-Jones already mentioned. Uh, today is the formal budget presentation and public hearing. We do plan to have a second public hearing in these council chambers on Wednesday at noon this week for anyone who might have been unable to attend this presentation. 
And then three weeks from now, we expect to be back here for the formal adoption of the FY18 proposed budget. We're available to answer any questions tonight if you or any citizens have them for us. You survived. I made it. You made it. Good job. I want to commend both of you and the department heads for the work and Ms. Jones for the team putting together such a detailed and rigorous document. I know this is the one vote per year that we have to do, <laughs> just like in the General Assembly. You have one thing you have to do, and that's to pass a budget and properly be custodians of the taxpayers' dollars. So thank you for the work you put in to date, and we're still accepting now public input. Do we have any questions? Or are there members of the council who would like to address a question to the staff before we actually hear from the public? This is a public hearing, so if anyone has a comment that they would like to offer, please uh, come forward at this time and offer your comments. You have another opportunity on Wednesday, as they pointed out, at noon, uh, or you can do so electronically through email to communicate with any member of council, the mayor, or the staff, uh, asking questions or uh, offering comments. This is your first public hearing opportunity if anyone has any input. Mr. Mayor, I see no comment at this time, but we continue to welcome online comment, in-person comment Wednesday, and up to June 5th when we will actually consider it at this panel for formal adoption. All right, Mr. Fennell, would you, um, oh, may I please have a motion? Oh, no motion. Okay. We'll get to that June 5th on the oh, motion. But okay. Thank you. This, is, this uh, hereby concludes the public hearing number one. Okay. Item C is authorization to purchase playground equipment with CDBG funds for Chuck Camp Park from Compen via the U.S. Community State Contract at a total cost of around $150,000. Ms. Sadler-Jones, will you please read the background? Yes, thank you, Honorary Mayor. Um, this is a request to uh, purchase playground equipment with CDBG funds for Chuck Camp Park from Compan via the U.S. Community State Grant at a total cost of $149,999.43. Compan offers a variety of playground pieces, and Chuck Camp Park will be the first park in the city to have this style uh, playground equipment that has been selected by our, our public, uh, I'm sorry, Parks and Recreation Director, Richard Garland. Delivery and installation is anticipated in June of 2016. The existing playground, I'm sorry, yeah, 17, wrong year, 2017, pardon me. <laughs> the existing playground equipment was installed in 2003 and it is 14 years old and uh, most of our playground manufacturers are unable to supply replacement parts for playground equipment that is up to 15 years old. Um, so this is a request to purchase playground equipment for, uh, for Chuck Camp Park with CDBG funds. Ms. Wilkinson. Thank you. Um, I guess Richard is not here, is he? No. Uh, he um, Anyway, I think uh, one thing, I don't know if it's possible to put up uh, the rendering of the Space Net so the public can see, because it's kind of really neat, but is that possible, Terry? Or? Yeah. We, the rendering? Yeah, we don't have it on a thumb drive, but we can oh, okay. add it to our website if you Sure, I think that would that. be great. Yeah, yeah we'll, that, we'll add it to the website tomorrow. If you're familiar with the, my kids call it the spiderweb playground at Cobb Park, and it's like that times 10. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty cool. Right. So anyway, I think it'll be really a nice asset um, to that area. And I also think I understand that some of the playground equipment will stay there yes. for a little while. Yes. If my understanding, the toddler portion okay. of the playground will stay. It's in good condition to remain. Okay. Well, um, at this time, I will um, make a move to approve item 6C, um, 
2017-144, uh, the authorization to purchase playground equipment with CDGB funds for Chuck Camp Park from Compen via the U.S. Community State Contract at a total cost of $149,000. $999.43. Second. There is a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Yes, I just wanted to note quickly that I am, I am very excited about this project. It's CDBG funds are, that money comes from our federal tax dollars and it is always very nice to see that money come back to Smyrna so we can use it in a way that improves the entire community. I'm happy to support this. All in favor, please vote. The motion passes seven to zero. The next item on our list is number seven, commercial building permits, and there are none. And then the next item is the consent agenda. Ms. Sadler Jones, will you please read the consent agenda for council's approval? Yes, the consent agenda is as follows. Item A, approval of mayor and council meeting minutes for May 1st, 2017. Item B, approval of the committee of the whole meeting minutes for April 27th, 2017. Item C, award RFQ 17-027 Smyrna resurfacing project to the lowest bidder, Bartow Paving Company for $846,109.85 and authorize the mayor to execute any related documents. Most of the resurfacing will be funded by SPLOST except for the repaving of the parking lots at Tolleson and City Hall. They are going to be funded by CIP. And item D, approval of transition of flexible spending account administration from Guardian to Wage Works. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda? So Do I hear a second? I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please vote. The motion passes seven to zero. Item nine is committee reports. I would like to ask Mr. Derek Norton to start. Thank you, Mr. Honorary Mayor. I don't have a committee report, but I wanna thank you for being here with us tonight. You did a great job. You picked a long one, um, <laughs> but best of luck to you in the future. Thank uh, you. I wanna say a thank you to Kristen and Jared for all their work on the budget. Uh, great presentation tonight, thank you all. And. Um, to Tammy, glad, uh, glad we moved you up in the agenda because your son wouldn't have made it, I'm pretty sure. But uh, I think the citizens of Smyrna are gonna be well served and uh, congratulations uh, for, that, uh, for you in that position. That's all, uh, with that I yield. Ms. Andrea Bluestein. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, are you planning on a career in politics? I think you'd do well. Um, I haven't like thought about it. I was thinking about going into <laughs> law now, but I'm not sure. Possibly, oh, I don't know. Give it, give, you don't want to do that. Give it some thought. You've got a few years in college to, For sure. you know, <laughs> you might be good. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I don't have an official committee report tonight, so I do pass. Ms. Terry Anulowitz. Thank you, and thank you again for presiding over our meeting tonight. I wish you all the best when you matriculate to Brown University next year. Thank you. It was very exciting. The I, I did want to, um, Make one quick note in that for the vision committee, that is that Kelsey Scott, who has been the uh, community liaison, she is actually transitioning out of that role. Uh, and we're sad to see her go, but also completely understand. But she is um, leaving us with lots of information and lots of notes for all of the work that the committees have been doing. So we are looking forward to keeping the vision going and you will still be receiving the vision newsletter and things like that. I also wanted to congratulate Tammy Sadler-Jones as well. I'm very delighted and thrilled that she is our city administrator. With that, I yield. Mr. Corky Welch. Thank you, sir. Um, I want to thank you for coming out this evening as well. You did a fantastic job. Uh, the only thing I want to add to that is uh, to, to welcome Ms. Uh, Sadler-Jones and um, wish her nothing but the best. With that, I yield. Ms. Susan Wilkinson. I wanted to thank you as well. You've done a great job and we've enjoyed having you here tonight. Um, and also congratulations to Tammy. I'm excited um, for your new role. Uh, thank you. Mr. Doug Stoner. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, thank you for presiding tonight. You did a very good job considering this was not an easy, as long night. And I really would hope you would at least consider a career in public service. Don't, don't say no just yet and everything. But uh, again, also I want to thank Tammy to continue on. You know, we, you worked with us for many years as our assistant city administrator and glad to have you on board as our full-time city administrator and very, very, very happy to see you in that position. Thank you. I yield. Mr. Ron Fennell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to just note with all the work we've uh, had done by our team uh, on the budget, I wanted to acknowledge if I think I did earlier a month or so ago, but uh, we received a packet from the uh, uh, about our comprehensive annual financial reporting that we do. And uh, there was a, an acknowledgement through a certificate of achievement that we received from uh, the uh, the folks who do this for a living and I just wanted to acknowledge again how important it is for us to be recognized as a team for the uh, ongoing excellence in taking care of our taxpayers money and uh, I noticed that Cobb County last week received a similar acknowledgement of distinction and I don't know how many people really realize but the city of Smyrna, Cobb County, and the state of Georgia, all three enjoy a triple A bond rating. That is the highest achievement possible for municipal, county, and state governments. And I'm proud of the fact that there are very few places in the, the whole country that have that distinction of the trifecta. And so that gives us the triple A, triple A, and I'm thrilled to have that. And thank you for the team. Uh, for all that you've done. Uh, I just remind everyone that schools will be letting out over the next uh, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, your summer season and the outflow of kids into the streets will be starting, so I join with our public safety officials who do a great job in helping to keep an eye out, make sure that we keep our families and our children safe uh, during this time and uh, celebrate. It'll be summer soon. <coughs> with that, I yield. Mr. Cochran, do you have anything to add this evening? Yeah, just real quick, I'll say the same thing the other guys have said. Mr. Acting Mayor, as is the case every year, the IB students from Campbell come in here and bring up the average IQ in the room <laughs> dramatically. So I think, thanks for that. Um, Tammy, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, work together for a while, and I'm looking forward to this next chapter. And Jared, I don't know how you do it. That, that presentation, how you keep it all hanging to that, that, I mean, all at the, at the uh, at your fingertips. That is so much information to be able to articulate. I was impressed. And Mr. Acting Mayor, also, you mentioned you may want to be a lawyer and you would be an asset to the legal community if you choose to stay around here. So good luck to you. Thank you. Stay out of the Northeast. They don't need more lawyers up there. Miss <laughs> <laughs> um, Graham, anything to add this evening? Yes, I would. I'd like to, I'd also like to say to Harold, how, what a great job you did. Um, I was really proud of um, everything that you, how you worked through the, the meeting, and um, I wish you well in your, in, in your going to Brown and um, all your future endeavors. And also, I'd like to say that I'm looking forward to work, continuing to work with Tammy as well. Yeah, I think it'll be a great future. But, and with that, uh, thank you. Item 10 is show cause hearings. There are none. Item 11 is citizen input. And at this time, I would like to call Alex Bakey, I believe it is. Bakery. Bakery, I'm sorry. Bakery. that, uh, there we go, that no action has been taken on the city, so I'd like to bring up the subject again, and that's the remo improper removal of the no parking signs in my subdivision. Now, the city has, uh, did not take the proper vote in the first place based on the charter. Now, they did put up computer information signs 
To me, these are a smokescreen for what the real issue is. Those computers show if you need a bump, uh, speed bumps, if there's violations, running stop signs, what have you. Those are all moving. The real issue is the stationary uh, um, violations, which is no parking. So it's important that you don't, you separate the two. Uh, again, this is a, not the information that we need to have a vote from this council on a yes or no to put the signs back up or not. We did have a, a meeting and we're supposedly supposed to have a second meeting and uh, that's never happened. Another example of ineptness in communications by certain people on the council. There are people on this council that should take a course in proper communications because none of the residents were ever asked their input or the people that use the street. And that's what really bothers a lot of people. It's the communications of the people that pay your salaries. And uh, again, this was very sneaky in doing this in the first place. And all I'm asking is, if you have a charter, you follow the charter. Why have a charter if you're not going to properly pr pursue the procedures on it? And all I'm asking, and other people are asking me, for you to have a vote at the next council meeting, just two-minute vote, so we have proper closure, because this entire situation has been handled backwards. And it's just mind-boggling to me how this has all been miscommunicated and done wrongly. And again, I would like to see if we could have an improper vo impromptu vote here tonight. All I want is closure on how you all look, whether you should have the signs taken down or not at the next meeting. It takes two minutes and we'll have final closure so we know where the city stands on this issue. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I would like to call up Johnny Hacks. Okay, he's already left, okay. Um, Tim R. I'll try to make this short because it is, what, 9.44, quarter of 10. No, just a couple of questions, just a minor question, just a response. I'm going to make a comment, and you guys can respond afterwards. I'll walk away and sit down. That is, uh, at my, at, I guess it was two meetings ago, I brought up a subject of, like, there were some rumors going around at an excessive amount of owed per household in taxes. And one of the questions just when I started talking to two or three of the people here tonight was that... Uh, Hickory Lakes, let's, let's use Hickory Lakes as an example, was a profitable situation. And after reviewing it, using the numbers that were brought out at the last mayoral uh, campaign of that will cost the city around $25 million versus the revenue that we'll be bringing in, how do we justify $25 million bringing in on the, what is it, 194 homes there? I think it was, I don't have the paperwork in front of me, of an annual revenue of about $19,200 a year. And I would just like to hear a response of what justifies paying, spending $25 million versus the $19 million in revenue we'll bring. Or if you want to take it to a 30-year plan, taking the $30 million and invest it in a, in a CD, I'm just using that example, would bring us about $172 million in 30 years versus the 520,000 that revenue from taxes will bring in on that. I would just like a response, whoever wants to respond. Oh, okay. Um, at this time, I would like to call up Lee Hodes, if you're still here. No, okay. Um, Thomas Starr. Oh, okay, well, all right. Um, if there's no other business to be brought before this body, I call this meeting to be adjourned at 946. Thank you. Thank you.
you. I was very frazzled. You did a great job. Thank you. Job. Thank you. When is the graduation? Um, it's next Friday. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Congrats. Thank you. Well done. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I can I come around there. Or you want to come here. I wasn't yeah. going to, I'll find an answer that. Yeah. It's, 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 I see that and then, and I.